Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Ben Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffin Door, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone Chapter 10, Halloween. Oh, man. man. In the real world here, as we're recording this, it's like one week after actual Halloween. <laughs> I know. I know. Literally, as I was I was looking at our slate, I was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to hit the Halloween episode on Halloween, and then we'll hit the uh, Christmas episode on Christmas, and it's going to be so great. And then I just did my week math wrong, and in fact, we, we missed Halloween by one week. But either Your which week way, math is weak. My week math is, yeah, yeah incredibly weak. That's what rather, I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, unlike this chapter, which I will say, as I, as I cracked into Bacon. it i got in through the first few pages and i was like man i don't know if there's just something like off about my like the way i'm like listening today or like reading today but like i'm, I'm i don't have like a lot of like notes or marks that i'm putting down and then i got past the first three pages and i mean it's just like obliterated I had, yes i had like the same thing i was like man I, maybe not as much is happening it's just like we're sort of explaining the rules to quidditch here i guess you know that's just pretty straightforward that just has to be there yeah, you know, yeah. um there's that uh, actually i was sort of funny um last night I've, i don't know if i've mentioned it on this podcast yet but i've started reading my son this exact book uh, my oldest son, Luke. I cannot believe that you timed it out such that, yeah, w- while we're doing this particular podcast, you're also giving it like a read through to your son for the it first just time. Sort of, it just sort of worked out. I wasn't really sure. I wasn't like planning like, okay, I am I am counting down the days. Luke is officially ready. But like we have um, a bunch of different copies of the like books at my house. And like he knows that some of them are his because once upon a time, you and I got invited to uh, London to like host the thing for Pottermore. We did. Which yeah, we was. Got, we got to be on the front page of Pottermore yeah. one day, which yeah. was which was amazing and like you know like a bucket list item check. So cool! But while we were there, they took us to like all of the Harry Potter stops like around London, including Platform Nine and Three Quarters. And at this point, Luke was like six weeks old or something. He had like just been born, so uh, he was very fresh. But like you know, me and Beth were you know chatting. It was like no, you you have to go to London. You know, if if Google and Pottermore are asking you to do something, you probably have to do that. Yeah. So yeah. we we did the trip and. While we were at platform nine and three quarters, I was like, oh my gosh, I can buy Luke his very first Harry Potter book ever from the the store, the the platform nine and three quarters in London. I know it's amazing. Yeah, yeah so there, I, there, you actually have an amazing vlog where you talk about this yeah. exact thing. It's very emotional. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, if you want to see me get really emotional about buying Luke his first book, or if you want to see me even more emotional reading this book, you could just watch me read it to him because oh my gosh, I get a certain passages and I'm like, I can't, I can't. This is hard. Oh my god, this is such a big moment. Oh wow. <laughs> She's sharing this with Luke right now. Oh gosh! I <laughs> know. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, I think. I think the number one thing uh, when when expecting our daughter Addison was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get to read her the books one day. I so. know. Yeah. Good luck with that. Um, but so yeah, I, the, uh, when we were there, it was also the 20th anniversary of uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which is part of why we were there. Um, yes. I think. Um, and. So they had these 20th anniversary books out, which come in like different house varieties. So you can buy like the Gryffindor set of books or the Hufflepuff set of books. And I suddenly was like faced with trying to choose which house book was going to be Luke's first one. Right. And it was like, I was like, I stood in that store for like 30 minutes. (laughs) Like not knowing what to do and finally settled on uh, the Gryffindor uh, set of books because he had come out of the NICU and I was like, he's so brave. He's so brave. So that that's his very first Harry Potter book. And that's the one we're reading to him uh, now. But as it were, uh, last night, I just read him chapter nine. Um, and so tonight we'll be reading chapter 10. So I was like, I'm going to read this chapter twice today. <laughs> How about that? That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so as, as we said, I mean, Halloween's rather interesting uh, within the, the wonderful wizarding world because because it is it is known to be a rather eventful occasion for Harry and company. It is. There's yeah. almost always something happens on Halloween, which is like notable because it is also the date on which Voldemort attacked Harry as a baby. Right. And so you almost wonder if it's like a like a mildly cursed. Yeah. Cursed like day like or is something. there a cursed cursedness about it? Like in the same way that like the Defense Against the Dark Arts position is cursed. Right. But, yeah. 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 That's that's a good question because yeah, eventually we'll see. Um, I think like the the. Uh, nearly headless Nick's death day party will be on this occasion. Does Sirius Black enter the castle in, in Sirius book three? Black does, yeah, break into the castle on book three, on book four is when Harry's name comes out of the Goblet of Fire. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, it's like, what's interesting about that is that the Sirius one is like the complete opposite. Like Sirius is like, 
like one of Harry's greatest allies. But the other, the other, at least for the first four books, all the other ones are like almost Voldemort direct related incidents. Yes, they absolutely are. Yeah, which is which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, without any further ado, let's let's dive on into chapter ten, Halloween, um, where we were sort of coming on the heels of the the midnight duel, um, where Harry, Ron, mm-hmm. Hermione, and Neville have just sort of like ventured out to the castle in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. You're sort of getting a feel for like the different ways in which the different characters uh, might react to such, you know, um, rule breaking, yeah. if you will. Obviously, Hermione takes it incredibly difficult and and sort of like, you know, you start to see the the, the even greater uh, valley being forged between Harry and Ron and their relationship with Hermione, uh, which obviously will, will yet to be filled in in this same chapter. But yep. um, obviously, that's a really big one. Neville himself also is sort of continuing to demonstrate like a little bit more of his overall just Maybe cowardice like coward yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like a little bit you know like i, I don't like, think he's really stepped into not quite he's very much like i didn't want to be there the entire experience was the worst and i don't like dogs <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was like like i'm not even remotely curious what that dog is guarding it's right like, whatever it is totally fine you meanwhile, keep on guarding it <laughs> meanwhile harry and ron are like let's do it again let's have another wild adventure that was the coolest thing ever yep yep yeah. so um they're 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 all jazzed about it then of yeah. course uh shortly thereafter you know they go down to uh, the great hall for breakfast where where the um, arrival of a large parcel being carried by no fewer than is it six screech owls? Yeah, uh, so. which which will of course be um, Harry's Nimbus two thousand. Oh yeah, along with a uh, along with a letter, which you know the letter almost it feels like they could have like sent him a letter and been like, hey, can you come by my office later? It today? does seem like this was not the way to do it. <laughs> yes, yeah, especially because here's the other thing too. It's like you know, do not open the parcel at the table. It contains your new Nimbus two thousand, but I don't want everybody like knowing you got a broomstick or they'll all want one. Um, um, this is like one of those things where it's like, this is not really a secret that needs to be kept necessarily. Like the word is is starting to get out anyway. And also yeah. like the very thing that they're bending the rules for is a school wide and, and attended event, which is Quidditch. Right. So like, like people ev- are going to know Harry was yeah, like got or has a broomstick, has a broomstick. He's breaking the first year rule and also is on the Quidditch team. So it's right. Like, it's like if what they it seems like maybe what they don't want them to know is that like the school bought him the broomstick. But then absolutely. Yeah, just should have been like oh, Potter. Could you stay behind after Transfiguration? Right. You right. know, <laughs> like, this, this is like an interesting one, though, to me, though, as well, because like um, and, and I wrote some notes down here because like when when um, McGonagall takes Harry to talk to Oliver after catching the remember all in the first place. Um, Oliver just sort of like offhandedly is like, Professor, we'll have to get him a broom, you know, like as if this is just something that like Quidditch captains can sort of like dictate. Yeah. But like the the fact that it's not just any broom, it's like, you know, currently the best broom that happens to be on the market um, and that it's specifically from McGonagall. Like I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it in every which direction, because what I almost want to be the case here is that like McGonagall, who is a uh, like a famously stern character, I sort of just like the, the idea that like maybe she's got got like you know a little bit of empathy for both like harry's circumstances her own remembrance of like his parents it's maybe some like ex- like um appreciation for the role that he played in the downfall of like voldemort like i almost like to think that this is just quite literally a kind moment being demonstrated on behalf of of one minerva mcgonagall <laughs> yeah not and not just outright favoritism <laughs> and not just outright favoritism which i mean certainly on some level it feels like it is like even the fact that there are school <coughs> brooms it's like I, I i it's kind of like it feels like if there are just school brooms and it seems like in other instances harry is required to fly a school broom when i think his nimbus has been destroyed maybe he's received the firebolt yeah but, but like, isn't hasn't been allowed cleared to play yet, so has to practice with the school brooms with the school brooms yeah, yeah which was like, like there know. was an option and they were like no 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 no. those won't be good enough for uh, we can't let one of the one of the actual players ride on one of the school brooms unless they don't have their own and um, uh, our rules don't work. <laughs> yeah. Right. right yeah, 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 exactly. So anyway, I mean, there, there, I, there's something that I always really enjoy about a character who is notoriously uh, like kind of stiff in nature, but has like a kind or like gooey moment. 
a little bit. So anyway, that's that's sort of what I what I I like to think happens here. But yeah, it's my own personal head cannon. Yeah, but uh, also the the even even being wrapped up as a broomstick doesn't seem like it fools anybody for even one hot second. Malfoy immediately is like, "That's a broomstick." Yeah, and it basically cuts him off like the moment he leaves. Yeah, yeah it's like and it's uh, not only that. This is this is the second time in what two and a half pages that Malfoy has been like convinced Terry is about to get kicked out of school. But like, I don't like I have noticed before just like listening through the absolute obsession Malfoy has with Harry in there, the first year. There like, can be no doubt. He, it is like consuming all of his thoughts. Like I, I love the opening sentence of this uh, chapter too. It's just a Malfoy couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Harry and Ron were still at Hogwarts the next day looking tired but perfectly cheerful. Like in his mind, he has just like oust like his his goal was to oust Harry from Hogwarts and effectively the entire wizarding world by tricking him out of bed one night. One like, time. This yeah. is this like. is this is eleven year old Malfoy's plan. He's like, I'm just, I'm gonna just defeat Harry Potter right now. I'm gonna get him out of bed and that's it. That'll be the end of him forever. <laughs> See, it, but here's the thing too is that it's like I think that what's happening is is something that you can witness in a lot of like early uh, like relationships as well. Like you know as you're as you're sort of like going through your early you know foundational years and and kind of like having those first like crushes or whatever the case may be but like rejection not that Malfoy necessarily has a crush on Harry but I mean <laughs> he it, doesn't but, not Ben yeah right yeah, it's <laughs> like he certainly has taken notice of him um but I think that what's happening here you know is that, that Malfoy has extended that hand in friendship which uh you know Harry basically was like no and so I think that like it, it doesn't necessarily surprise me because like you know that that sense or feeling of rejection can oftentimes lead to this sense of like like need to prove oneself in some other you know mm -hmm. capacity oh it's not only was he rejected by harry but harry is effectively filling the role he thought he would have at school he and if Harry wasn't there this year, he pretty much would have that role. We, yeah, we, yeah, we've said it over and over again. Yeah, it's, it's hilarious because it's like, you know, we always see Malfoy as the adversary to Harry, but Malfoy seems to be pretty universally liked by just about everybody else who, who like, it doesn't seem like Malfoy deals with the struggles that you might expect from somebody that is obviously just being a bully all the time right you know it's like it's almost much more like he's like the super popular kid who's decided like i mean this is i mean again this is james potter's dislike of snape right you know it's like people don't didn't dislike james potter for his distaste of snape you know that he like he was still renowned he was still oh that's the, such an interesting comparison like james is to snape as draco is to harry yeah yeah and it's like otherwise yeah it's like no one remembers james potter as like some bad guy at school Right. No, yeah. not at all. I yeah, mean, Draco exactly. does become a Death Eater, so there's that. There's that, but yeah. I mean, he eventually comes around. He doesn't get quite that. He doesn't get the. I mean, we'll we'll talk about it way, 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 way more in Deathly Hallows. He doesn't get quite the redemption arc I, I would have preferred. I anyway, would agree with that. Doesn't matter. Um. So as we yeah as we move forward here though, uh, there's 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 you know, uh, Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle kind of like pin Harry and Ron back. They discover the uh the Nimbus, which you know it's kind of interesting to me. They like literally like snatch it from his hands and then throw it back. I'm like this feels like one of those instances where it's just like the the remember all all over again. Like I've got your broomstick, Potter. Now I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got my two big games with me. Um, you can't have it back. But then, um, you know, even even uh, Flitwick's arrival, you know, is sort of like an interesting neutral party here as like, you know, head of Ravenclaw house. Right. Because he's just sort of like, oh, yes, of course. I know about this situation entirely. Like, you yeah. know, it's like <laughs> we all had a little good laugh about it. Of course, we'll break the rules for Harry. For him. Mean, he I saved know. all of wizard kind. I know. I would, what would it have been like if Snape had been the one to stumble onto them here? Like Potter. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially with the first match of the season being against Slytherin right like, right you know so it's it's i mean it feels like the type of thing where mcgonagall and snape's rivalry it almost feels to me like snape would just be like hmm you're not supposed to have that breaking the rules again as i expected mm -hmm. um which also you know wouldn't totally surprise me if mcgonagall like is, is quietly trying to keep it a secret so the snape doesn't know i know but like clearly if flitwick knows then snape must know must know must know yeah right certainly also they um they malfoy's uh personal broom is revealed to have been a comet 260 yes which is uh uh, just a fun inclusion here because Ron Ron has like an interesting relationship with hating this broom where or just hate, like like uh, this is also the broom that Cho is later riding okay. whenever she gets introduced to the story. She rides a Comet 260 as well and Ron is all like on her about like being a 
what uh, a, a fair weather fan for the whatever the tornadoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> He's yeah. just like what? No, oh, no, no. Everyone just likes them now because they're good. And it's like, uh, like whoever whoever rides the Comet two hundred and sixty, Ron's a little like, what is this? What? No, uh. Uh-uh. But I, yeah. I mean, but I like the I like the fact that they like they specifically say comets look flashy, but they're not in the same league as the Nimbus. It's like I feel like this does this. This is almost like um like car guys that I've known throughout my life. I feel like there is something to this kind of thing, like you know, cars that might look fast, but aren't mm-hmm. fast but then like you know then like a, like a true gearhead knows like oh no he's like this is a car to appreciate because like underneath that hood like it's a it's a sleeper you yeah know, that, that thing can go now um, the two th- that is absolutely true but also on that same note harry like one paragraph later is like i have no idea what brooms are but this looks nice <laughs> yeah. that, that's a good point that's a good point uh speaking of as we're getting the description of the uh nimbus it says um let's see here it looked wonderful sleek and shiny with mahogany handle and a long tail of neat straight twigs and nimbus 2000 written in gold near the top um one of the things i find kind of interesting about this in particular and the wood in particular is that it's mahogany which is the same as james's wand oh yeah um which is kind of a fun detail because I feel like Harry's affinity and knack for Quidditch is sort of like reflected through like his his like you know skill inheritance from his father a right. little bit um, so it feels like a little bit of like a, a nod there to that um, just another side note from from uh, reflecting on the movies I always kind of felt like the this maybe goes against literally the exact gearhead comment I just made but the Nimbus always looks the way I feel like the firebolt is supposed to look yes in the films and then the firebolt comes out and it's sort of got like a much more almost like off-road rugged scraggly yeah. appearance yeah know. like the the end of it looks like it's been going so fast that the the bristles are just like sort of blown out looking yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. where it's like but that is not at all how it is described in the book where it's supposed to be like extremely sleek extremely fast like each twig hand picked and it's like that's not it doesn't look aerodynamic no no it looks it looks like closer to a broom but the nimbus looks like an aerodynamic broom it's yeah like, from the moment i remember seeing that as a kid growing up it was sort of like it, it sort of took this notion that i had in my head of like witches flying brooms in in like halloween posters yeah you know and kind of being this like silly sort of like you know i always imagined like a broomstick like your your classic um like straw bottom with wooden handle right like, that you'd find in in like a an actual household broom cupboard and they showed us the nimbus and it was like dang it's a vehicle it's a vehicle like, yeah. now that thing is cool looking and to this day i've always sort of coveted one so i agree i think the yeah the way they made the nimbus look in the first two movies is amazing and i think the way the firebolt looks is dumb and like they also added like the the foot rests on the fire on the firebolt which i ben i am so anti foot rests on broomsticks yeah like i think it is so it looks like they put training wheels on the broom uh, like it's like okay but you took those off after they turned like four right okay <laughs> like that's like that's just it's like a kickstand that's like a kickstand for you, your broom right right also they abandoned the entire thing we we're supposed to be like up to make the brooms fly up like oh, right you right, know yeah. like uh th- that is a, never a thing again that's like just the first time they ever ride them <laughs> well it does seem kind of silly unless there would be a situation where everybody's broomstick was already on the pitch but i feel like they always show it to us with all the characters carrying them out yeah there. so it'd be like it'd be like hilarious if you like watch them all walk out set the broomstick on the ground just so they could then summon it back into the right yeah <laughs> to take off um but i could I, I feel like i could actually see a world where you like line up similar to like a, like a soccer match and everybody's yeah. like you know roughly in their position and all the broomsticks are like laid out before them and it's sort of like part of the strategic configuration as to how each team kicks off the match it's like everybody's broomsticks start on the ground oh right yeah you, know, like you like, have to like yeah get it off the ground and kick off yeah yeah it's like yeah. it's like the tip off in basketball or something yeah. you know it's like you know there's there's like a little little bit of you know the tip-off can kind of go either way it's it's the it's like the athletic coin flip you know right so to speak mm-hmm. um which maybe anybody who plays basketball is like that is not a coin flip at all and there's a ton of skill involved with having your best jumper or tallest i'm sure there is yeah, yeah i mean yeah. you know yeah i mean get it to your get it to your point guard right away <laughs> pe- people consider this this is not like just yeah not not total not total chance, but either which way. Yeah, we sort of get like a little bit of the introduction, you know, a little bit more to Oliver Wood, who again, as a kid, it was a character that I always just like endeared. I, oh, I always loved Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood is great. And then his character in the movies is even like better. They're like this kid with the Irish accent. And I feel like 
every girl I knew ever had a crush on Oliver Wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's just like, there's something like just exactly right about, yeah. about how he ends up being in the movie. It's like, you make a fair beater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, as I was like reading, I was like, does he say that in the book? Because I can't, I can't remember whether or not he does. Um, which, of course, I don't, I don't think he does in, the, in, in here. Oh, he, speaking of basketball, though, this is another one of those just like silly wizard things where Harry's like, oh, that's like basketball, but I'm broomstick with six hoops. And he's like, what's basketball? And I'm like, yeah, you can't, are you telling me that wizard kids don't know any muggle sports at all? Like it seems it, of course muggle kids can't know about Quidditch because that whole world's a secret, but like sports are still a big it, it doesn't it doesn't track with me that wizards don't follow muggle sports at all. It, it does. Yeah, and you're right because I do think the perspective shift is very different based on the, like whether or not you're a wizard versus if you are a muggle because you're exactly right. I mean, you hit the nail on the head like the statute of secrecy dictates and like primary objective of all wizard kind is basically to exist essentially like unbeknownst to the muggle world, yeah. the magical world. And, um, you know, but like that, that means, you know, I think like Hogsmeade is one of the only, you know, British uh, exclusive wizard communities. Like even Godric's Hollow, I've mentioned yeah. this before, is like has muggles that live there. So it's like you would have basic exposure just just by existing kind of like quietly from within these, these right like you, even if you don't follow it it seems hard to not know what basketball is especially because not two paragraphs later he's throwing golf balls for Harry to catch as stand in snitches and it's like okay you have golf balls which means you must know that those come from the muggle sport of golf and golf is just much more obscure than basketball so yeah yeah, yeah no it does seem a little bit surprising um and i i wrote that exact same note down as well where it's like well he knows about the golf balls but i suppose i suppose there's some world where he just has small white balls and has no idea what the sport of golf is sure i guess that's possible that he's just like these are conveniently sized right yeah this this is this is about it <clears throat> um you, this is this is another one of those occasions like where as you get further into the series and you learn more about like the golden snitch and some of the attached lore of the snitch in particular is that it seems like they are one time use objects like they're, they're yeah. like effectively like created for every single match and and because i mean they they you know like the one that dumbledore will eventually give harry is the one that he'll catch in his first ever match yeah and that has like the the flesh memory attached to it so yeah you, you know who like wins the contested um you know bout or whatever uh like who touched it first which is also a little bit flawed logic because somebody could like nick it and just not yeah. catch it but right <laughs> um Either which way, this is like one of those where it seems like the case contains what is otherwise like Hogwarts snitch. Yeah, or it's like, just like a like a training snitch or something. Maybe I guess it must be. Yeah, I, right. Exactly. Yeah. Like it, it, what my honest opinion here is that the lore of the snitch had not been properly built out yet, and I'm not fussed about that. Right. But I would say at this point in the page, as these words were written down, I would I would suspect that it had not yet been concluded that every single snitch was unique in its own special way. Yeah, I would I would pretty much agree with you. Yeah, on that yeah. as well. Uh, moving on, he starts getting to the rules of the game where I just I do. There are so many things about Quidditch that I love and so many things that I'm like, why this? Why is it that way? But um, the, the fact that I love the game design that catching the snitch ends the game that there's not like a set time limit to it so you could have very long games or very short games yep that is so cool but the 150 points is just too many <laughs> like it is just like there's there's no way that it's there's like i mean he says it right there an extra 150 points so they nearly always win it just like it makes it feel like the rest of the game which is otherwise so cool like doesn't matter it's just like whoever catches the snitch pretty much gets it you know yeah it's it, it needs it, to be like like 30 points and you end the game or something no i but it's it's interesting too because i mean like you will you'll like later on we'll get like the i think the record for the longest match is three months yeah so keep bringing on substitutes so players can get could get some sleep, which is just flat out absurd. Three months would be like far too long. People wouldn't be able to continue to spectate. It would just be like, like, and who, who are these like unbelievably inept seekers? I know. That like, you know, the, the snitch can't leave the pitch area and they're just, they're just out there for, for months. They're just months forever. You know what the real problem is? I wrote this out on the other page is that if you've got like, if you're a team, if I, it has to have happened at some point in Hogwarts history, where just like all of the beaters weren't very good or something like I, it seems to me that if you're at like 
you know, middle school, high school age Quidditch. There's a lot of games that are severely dictated by the bludgers. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, in, in, uh, a couple of thoughts here, because one of the things I was going to say is that simply if the match lasted for three months, then 150 <laughs> points is probably like null and void. Oh, you're right. Yeah. And at that point, it's just like, just end the game, man. Right. Just like, I mean, come on. The score could could or would be in the thousands. Um, the other is that um, Oliver Wood says, don't worry, the Weasleys are more than a match for the bludgers. I mean, they're a pair of human bludgers themselves. Uh, this is pretty high praise coming from Oliver Wood, who, um, you know, has just become Quidditch captain and the Fred and George are only uh, what they're in their Are they in their third year? Third year. Yeah. Their third year, which means that they've only played one year of Quidditch themselves so far. So yeah. like as second years, they not only made the team, but were good enough to get this kind of praise, yeah. which is pretty impressive. Um, the other thing I was going to say, though, about the points is um, they do come up in the standings as as something that is otherwise somewhat important. Yeah, that is true that it's like, you know, you we have to be up by this much and then catch the snitch. So it's sort of like a if you can let your team like even if you could catch it right away, maybe it behooves you in the standings to let your team try and score like as many points as possible before you end the game. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I think I think that could be like one of those where it's sort of like, you know, the the general thought is that like if you see the snitch, you catch a snitch, like like let that be that. Um, but right. I feel like that that lends a little bit more credence to the thought like, OK, like I saw the snitch, but it's too early based on where we're at in the season. And if we want to be able to move up against this other team, then we have to like, you know, I got to trust my chasers for a little it, while. It seems that there could be some like seriously like ganging up on certain teams. Like if you know that like Ravenclaw's put out a poor team this year and it's like, all right, guys, we're going to try to get to like 1500 points this game. Oh, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah, so just yeah. run it up as high as you can. And then, you know, Harry, uh, you know, uh, I'll give you this. If we get over a thousand, just try and catch it at that point. Cool. <laughs> cool, cool. But even if they catch it at that point in time, we'll be fine. Yeah, we're, we're good because, you know, yeah. we're just we're just going to focus on chasing this game so you just block their seeker all right they've got a what a comet 260 <laughs> they're flashy but not in the same league as the nimbus exactly yeah exactly so anyway that gets us through i think most of uh quidditch for the most part right is there do you have any other thoughts on on that before we kind of move on to the next major because this is almost like two chapters in one chapter it, there is a little bit there's like the quidditch half and then the halloween half that there is just the note that charlie weasley says he could have played for england if he hadn't gone off chasing dragons and it's like i'm really surprised charlie doesn't go to play Quidditch because like it doesn't it always like when they have the World Cup it makes it seem like all these different countries have these like deep deep leagues with extremely professional Quidditch players but then you have Oliver Wood who is by all accounts an amazing Quidditch player and it's on like the B team for what like England Puddlemere or, or Puddlemere United which yeah. doesn't even sound like the like the you know the, the, like a Premier League team or something right it's right. like like he's you know back up on a backup team or something it's like the the pool for recruitment for professional quidditch teams is not very big because there's only one school in england you know yes it's exactly like where are they recruiting all their quidditch players from like most of the english players must be from hogwarts you know and it's not just england because it's like there's a team for england and a team for wales and a team for ireland so like the those like and probably one for Scotland then. So like those four countries all are reaping players from one school's worth of talent. And it's like, no wonder they're not very good or getting thumped by Transylvania or something. Right, you know? right, right. Like, Which I think is who they lose to when yeah. they're at the World Cup. Yeah, no, you're, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I think that, that that's probably... Because, I mean, yeah, you've effectively got, at any given point in time, you know, Hogwarts, who has four teams, each with about seven players. So, yeah. you know, there, there's effectively and like 28 players being trained every seven years yeah and it's not like 28 players are graduating every year because they're not all seventh years exactly yeah exactly so like maybe on like a good year like 14 new potential players exit hogwarts but you got to think out of 14 not all 14 of them are like pro quality you know That's, like they yeah. gotta they can't be uh, what i'm saying is the pro quidditch teams really can't be that picky or you know about who who they're fielding unless unless it's just the case that like like th the people who make the school quidditch teams are the cream of the crop but then you've also got like like you know cormac mcclagan who never ends up actually like truly being on the team for any significant length of length of time but probably could go on to play 
professionally or like Seamus, you know, sure, I guess, you know, but, the, but then you have the Oliver Wood problem being like on the, the backup squad for puddle mirror. Well, this is true. You this know, is true. although to be fair, this is the other thing, too, because this is the point I was going to bring up is that uh, he says, I wouldn't be surprised if you turn out to be better than Charlie Weasley and he could have played for England. It's like Charlie, um, like, isn't it the case that or is it just the house cup? Is it the house cup that they've lost for like so many years to Slytherin? They've lost like seven years in a row to Slytherin. Yeah, in the, but just the house cup, but not yeah, the Quidditch cup. Not the Quidditch cup. Okay, okay. So maybe it's like the the big question is if Charlie was so good, then like surely Gryffindor must have been winning the Quidditch cup. Yeah, you they, think. they were never bottom of the table. We know that. Much. We know that. Yeah, they haven't finished fourth in over a century. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. No, I I don't have a I don't have a grand explanation there. But again, I feel like I've brought this up a couple of times. But Charlie is super prominent in book one. But then I feel like I feel like Charlie gets to own like the first half of Harry's experience in terms of like the the Weasley references, and then yeah. Bill pretty much takes over. Takes over. The yeah, half. He gets a whole wedding. You know, it's a whole, it's a whole yeah. affair. It's a Mary Fleur. Mary's Fleur de Lacour. Yeah. Man, amazing stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so on to Halloween. On to Halloween. Yes, um, there, there's an interesting little tidbit here that I always find kind of fascinating because whenever you're reading the story, um, it always comes across as if like Harry is basically having eventful day after eventful day after eventful day. Um, and, you know, it's like it's like every, every bit you follow, it's sort of like Snape is always picking on him. Malfoy is always being a problem. Seamus is always doing whatever, you know, like it's, right. it's always something, something, something. And then we get one sentence just says Harry could hardly believe when he realized that he'd already been at Hogwarts for two months. Right. <laughs> this is like one of those moments where like the story just takes like one great big step forward. Yeah, because Otherwise, these books would be like 3000 pages. Yeah, long. basically, it was like, and then Harry went to school and had classes like usual for two weeks. Yes, and it's Halloween. Yeah. And, then, and then it's Halloween. So time has changed. The, the the other important note here is that like you don't get like a great scope of how much the relationship between Hermione and Harry and Ron uh, has been sort of like, you know, wedged. But like this, this sort of like notion that two months had passed means that like from the midnight duel until the events of Halloween, like they've basically basically been like cold shouldering each other right. completely, like and, and and just completely not getting along. So yeah. So then it also feels like okay, that's a very long time for Hermione to have really not had any friends at school too. That's also true. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. So then we get to a uh, charms class where they're learning Wingardium Leviosa, which it's surprising to me that two months in they haven't done this spell to float feathers, um, but. None, nonetheless, well, Jay, I mean, as Flitwick points out, uh, wizard Barufio, who said S instead of F and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. Ben, I have so many fun facts about Barufio, the wizard. You pull, pull, lay them all. Yeah, on I'll because, be, because I was like, first of all, I was like, I like I want at what spell was he trying to do that? The missing that saying like f instead of s ended up summoning a buffalo onto his chest like I, I don't know which because we don't know what the buffalo summoning charm is or whatever he was trying to do, but it obviously wasn't when guardian Leviosa because that doesn't have any F's in it. So <laughs> what, what yeah. doesn't make sense to me is that it's he specifically said S instead of F and yes. found himself on the floor with a buffalo a word that notably has F's in it and no s's in it. Yeah. Yeah. So what what did he say? I have I have no idea, but apparently in the French version of Harry Potter, this paragraph goes a little bit differently because whoever was like doing the dub was like trying to play with some alliteration. OK, but um, it that after you translate it from French, it says remember wizard Barufio who had a speech impediment and whose wife was left with a buffalo on her shoulders instead of a mink. So they like mess it around a little bit, but it introduces Barufio's um, mix up as the result of a stutter rather than or as a as, as a part of a speech impediment, speech impediment as okay. uh, instead of just like a um, mistake. So that I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but then also Barufio comes up later as the creator of Barufio's brain elixir. Yes, which is something that they are. Um, someone tries to sell it to Ron in his fifth year as a way to get like better grades on their like OWLs. OWLs. Yeah, but apparently or if this if you go look on um, pot or the Wikipedia Barufio's brain elixir did not work at all and pose serious health hazards if improperly brewed. So it seems like Barufio uh, is most famous for making an ineffective potion that does the exact opposite of what it says and for some a buffalo either on himself or his wife's chest. 
um, by um, mispronouncing a word. But then interestingly, despite the fact that Berufio's brain elixir doesn't have a good reputation in the text, there is also, do you remember the, I'm sure you do. Yeah, um, Wizards Unite. Wizards Unite. Yeah. In Wizards Unite, Berufio's brain elixir was like a, uh, and uh, an experience multiplying potion, which made it like one of the best potions in the game. I, that was that was honestly like I got to this sentence and this, this is like one of those moments in, in like, you know, the in the books where I was just like, I've read these books so many times and, and for whatever reason, this entire fragment has never stood out to me before. Like as as I'm like reading through it for for the show, I was like. I've, I've never read this sentence before in my entire life. Like, and, and, but then all of a sudden it's like, but surely I have, yeah. you know, and which is just so this, this would be a question on like a trivia, you know, stream or, oh, or yeah. Jay versus Ben ride back. I have literally no idea, but hopefully now Barufio will be, will be baked into my yeah, brain. You got forever. it. You yeah. got it now. Um, but moving on just slightly from that paragraph though, this is sort of like an interesting little tidbit that I always find to be kind of hilarious about the first book is that, it says it was very difficult. Harry and Seamus switched and flicked, but the feather they were supposed to be sending skyward just lay on the desktop. Um, th- this is just about as close other than like when Harry purchases his wand. This is as close as we ever get to Harry performing a spell in the entire first book. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like like it feels like, you know, you get to see you get to see him like enter the wizarding world. You get to see him experiencing all these first, you know, having his first chocolate frog and birdie bots every flavored bean. Right. And, and he, you know, he does make, some accidental magic. He makes the glass disappear and he flies the broom and stuff like that. Right. Exactly. But like you would think that like the moment that he casts his first spell would be his own like 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 a chapter dedicated to it, like like this like remarkable sensation of 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 you know the magic channeling through yeah. him and his relationship with his wand. Instead, no, yeah, most of his relationship with magic in the first book is like his interaction with magical objects. Yes, like yes. flying on the broom, catching the remember all, using the invisibility cloak, looking at the mirror of air. Said you know? right, right, yeah. So he interacts with tons of magical things. Yeah, but he, but he never actually like successfully, at least on page, on page, yeah, ca- cast the spell. spell. Yeah, um, which, you know, it's just that you, you, you got to bring it up. Then I mean, you've of course got the the rather infamous or famous at that, yeah. uh, that rate when Guardian Leviosa, you know, it's it's. Oh, yeah, I circled that whole exchange. It's that uh, just wrote like who knew how popular this exchange would be. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. I know. Yeah, like this is this has been made into just like every single punified version of T-shirt. You know? Yes, like if you go to um, Universal Studios and you're walking through Diagon Alley, like you'll see somebody's wearing a Wingardium Leviosa. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Just one of the best scenes in the movies um, and really sets up the second half of the chapter where Hermione is correcting Ron on how to do it. And then, of course, she correctly does it. So that's the worst when someone's like correcting you and you're like hating them for it. But then like they're succeeding and it's like want to listen to you. I uh, yeah. that's exactly <laughs> even it. though it, clearly I need to. Brr. Yep, yep, that's it's yeah. th- this is another one of those kind of like the the crush scene from from earlier. This is like such a classic high school moment where like where, where somebody is just genuinely got some talent in a specific topic like they're they're excelling at something and it's like you may resentfully have to sort of take their advice but like you, it's like I would rather do it wrong I'd rather than, do than, it than accept the way I'd rather do it wrong ah, <laughs> nailed it uh, then, speaking of whom the next page uncharacteristically mean is Ron where Hermione is crying and Harry says I think she heard you and he says so <laughs> Yeah, but so, she must have noticed she's got no friends like oh savage Ron. He, it does. It does have the decency to say said Ron, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I think that this is another relatable middle school high school moment. Like I've said before, I think middle schoolers are probably amongst like the most um, potentially. <sighs> What is it? What is the best way to describe it? Like perceptive. I mean, they're they're highly perceptive, but they don't have like the decency nor like the own personal experience of being on the receiving end of negative comments to filter themselves at all. And so it's like as you're as you're reaching this stage where you have like you you're like social life is becoming a thing for yeah. real. Like elementary school has social life and kids are like mean to one another, but that's usually more out of like like j- basic jealousy, you know, or like yeah. I have this toy, I don't want to share this toy with you, like that are like you know, reactional emotions. E- exactly, yeah. but like I think once you reach middle school, you finally reach the stage where you're like able to be mean. Everybody's in like a very awkward like in between phase where they're not really a kid anymore, but they haven't really become an adult yet. Um, it's like it's a it's a difficult 
and complex age. And, and I, that's, I mean, I, this stood out to me in particular specifically because of that one phrase, because it says, so said Ron, but he looked a bit uncomfortable. This to me is almost like, like Ron being like, no, I have decided that this person is my adversary, but like also like, I think he's having like a, like a small pang of right. guilt. Like, right. Like, like he's, he's like testing the waters with being mean. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's like, but he doesn't like the feeling of making right. somebody cry is what is what I want to interpret. From yeah. I think you're absolutely right about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, as we, as we scroll down a little bit here though, we of course learn, um, you know, from Parvati and Lavender that Hermione's crying in the girl's bathroom, which will, will is a little bit of, you know, set up for how they'll know where to go as the scene unfolds a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one that, that sort of stood out to me though is um, they're, they're there for the Halloween feast where yep. there's, you know, thousands of live bats flying around the ceiling and all the rest. Um, but it said the feast appeared suddenly on the golden plates as it had at the start of term banquet. This is kind of interesting because it means that the food doesn't always magically appear. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I, I wrote that down too. just said like, wait, is this not always the case? And I think what it means is that like for like a feast, they will have all of the plates and stuff just like laid out for everyone in advance. And then like all at once, they're just like a boom, massive amount of food. Whereas like, I think if you come down to breakfast, there's like, you probably just take a plate and there's like, there's a plate of sausages and I'm sure the food magically appeared there, but it wasn't like a big, like, Ooh, yeah, you like, know, like event. The, yeah. Yeah. We're not, we're not using the <clears throat> fine gold plate. Exactly. Every single day. Yeah. 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 They got you. That makes sense. Um, because otherwise not that hair is reaching for anything fancy, Ben. he's still going for that baked potato, for that, for the baked <laughs> potato in the wonderful magical world. No, um, th th this, the only note I had about that in particular was like, it, if in the event that it's not always magicked up there, it can't be being delivered by house elves, which we know are the people who work in the kitchens. Yeah, because they don't know about the house elves until year four. Yeah, like they haven't seen them at all. So I think they are still magically sending them up. They're just not like it's not like a, a huge to do. Yes. OK, OK, yeah. less less of like less of the pomp and circumstance there. Okay, right. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Um, then we've got the scene where Quirrell comes racing into, uh, you know, the great oh, hall. Iconic, <laughs> iconic. Absolutely. This is like one of my favorite uh, like clips to use from, you know, the movies in our SCB videos, but it's just the Troll in the dungeons. I thought you ought to know. I thought you ought to know. <laughs> <laughs> that he <laughs> really demonstrates his spectacular acting abilities. Yeah. Um, because what we what we'll eventually learn is that Quirrell is quite good with trolls. He is quite good with trolls. Even this, even this is quite the performance as well. Because like clearly he doesn't actually. Well, I don't think he actually faints. And um, and he's lying about where the troll is because the troll is not in the dungeons. It's like up on the near the third floor. Yeah. Or, the, yeah. Th this is yeah. this is like one of those things where it's like the fact that. The, I mean, everybody leaves the Great Hall. All the kids are supposed to be going back to their dormitories. And like the teachers somehow don't find. I mean, maybe what happens is that like the the teachers listen to Quirrell, take him at face value and go to the dungeons. Well, I think that's what he's hoping that he's like, let me send as many teachers as possible as far away from where I want to go as possible. Uh, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, that's a good point. That makes more sense because what he's trying to do is get through. Yeah, because he wants to go try and get past Fluffy. That's that's exactly yeah. it. You're right. You're right. So he's definitely sending him on a, on a fool's errand. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, though, we then know that um, Harry and uh, Ron are now, uh, of course, concerned because Hermione does not know because she's in the girls' bathroom and not at the feast. And so then they're sort of like, okay, you know, we're, we're going to have to go and, and look for her. Right. And, you know, yeah, like let, let her know. We can't we can't like, you know, just like have her face a troll completely on her own, which ends up being great instincts because it turns out exactly where she is, is where the troll is as yep, well. Yep. Classic instincts by Harry. Also, before we get to that, I want to I just this is something I wrote down, which uh, I think we should address is that as far as all the teachers know, the troll is in the dungeon and Dumbledore is like, all right, prefix, take your students back to your common rooms and not for nothing, but the Slytherin common room is in the dungeons. <laughs> oh, true. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so he's just like, uh, yeah, all right. Slytherins, you're good. Go to the dungeons. It's fine. That's where the troll is. Don't worry about it. It's yeah, good. Just just if you see it, just go the other way. Just go the other, just way. Go the other way. And then I know then when they when they're watching the um uh, the the troll that even sees Snape going. He's clearly going to cut off Quirrell or whatever in this moment. But like even Snape, 
who is the head of Slytherin House isn't in the dungeon with his students where apparently the troll is. Right, right, right. But I mean, I, and again, to be fair, we know that we we know Snape in particular specifically like being told by Dumbledore to keep an eye on Quirrell yes, we, at this yeah. stage in the process. So yeah. it, it stands to reason that probably what happened was everybody exited the Great Hall. Snape watching Quirrell, knowing that Quirrell is up to no good, it saw him stand up and race off in the other direction and then chased him that way as well. Uh, what, what The thing I thought you were going to mention here is that um, Harry and Ron hear somebody coming and they think it's Percy, so they hide behind a large stone griffin, which of course, you know, is the, the yep. namesake here of mm-hmm. our, of our yes, podcast. That's true, true. The griffin door. Does that mean they're hiding right outside the headmaster's office? They are indeed. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's my interpretation. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much has to be it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so from, from there, though, um, obviously they, uh, th- 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 I find this to be sort of like an interesting turn of events or uh, I don't know, uh, like the writing maybe feels like just a tiny bit clunky because mm-hmm. they're specifically heading in this direction to find Hermione in the bathroom so that they can warn her about the troll. And basically they start to smell the stench of the troll itself, yeah. watch it enter into a room, right? I guess which maybe they don't know what room it is, but just a room. The room itself has a key already in the lock, yep. which is kind of like a strange one because it's like if, if you're going to the restroom, it seems like the key would be on the inside right. for yeah. the person in the restroom, yes, not on the outside where somebody could just especially lock students, you in, lock you in. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that seems silly. But so Harry being ever brave uh, jumps forward and locks the troll inside of this room. At this point in time, flushed with their victory, they started to run back flushed. up the passage. <laughs> ah, nailed it. <laughs> but as they reach the corner, they hear something that made their heart stop. They, literally, they were going in this direction to find Hermione in the bathroom the very room that they just locked the troll inside right. of upon locking the troll inside of the room. They run away. Yeah, it's like it's, it's like, yeah, it's like it's like they've like a band. I mean, maybe it's just like the, the the fact that the troll is there. It's like, all right, we I'm sorry, Hermione. Like we got to we got to <clears throat> we got to get out of here. Yeah, probably she's not. Maybe she's not. But the thing is, like, yeah, like the, they realize that the troll is going into the bathroom, right? Because that's the room they were going to. Presumably, that, that's one. That's my exactly. thought as yeah. well. Yeah, right. It's like, like, and it's almost, like, yeah, and you're right. And you're right. Why is there a key in the door? And also, what do you think the key is going to do to stop the troll from getting out? Right. It feels like you the know, troll probably can just the punch troll the can door. just punch the door right through. I mean, just, yeah, either because I don't think locking the door makes a difference to the troll. Probably so not. Having a closed door is one thing. I guess maybe that will deter it, but it seems like locking it is like the the extra step. All they really do is truly trap Hermione in a bad situation. Yes, they, yes, yeah. in fact they do. So anyway, they they wheel around and discover that of course Hermione is now trapped inside of the bathroom with the troll. Uh, at which point Harry and Ron sort of sort of do. Um, you know, kind of what Harry, Ron, and Hermione will ultimately do pretty much all throughout the series, which is just doing something that is both like admirable, but also equal parts reckless. Yeah. Um, you know, so they're, they, you know, they, they demonstrate like a little bit of their bravery. They immediately jump into action where, you know, it's like, okay, like we can't let Hermione be hurt by the troll. We must, we must save her. Right. Um, at what, at what point in time, you know, so you to get that, that like neat piece of symmetry where now Ron is using the advice on behalf of Hermione to save Hermione, right? Even though, yeah, but he, and she only needs saving because of things he said to her. Yes, yes. Yeah, which, it's like this nice sort of like circle, and then it's like she she's only trapped in there because they trapped her in there. Yes. So this is this is literally what I wrote at the end of the chapter was I love the almost rock paper scissors dynamic the trio has in this particular chapter. None of them are exactly faultless, but together they can all come they can all overcome each other's shortcomings. Yeah. Um. It's sort of like each of them is sort of like both in the same way that rock, paper, scissors works, it's like they're, they're all like they're completing exactly that, like a circle. Right. It's like they, they all sort of have like a fault that causes something else to happen that causes a strength to happen that causes a strength to happen that causes a strength to happen. Like and, and then they can sort of like orbit each other and, and like balance right. each other out, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so, of course, you know, <laughs> Harry, Harry jumping on the back of the troll is like the thing where I'm like, well, that was, yeah. was that was, was what that were ever, you hoping what, to do? Was that ever going to work? Right. Um, but then really Ron, you know, is is kind of the hero of the moment here. Ron is the hero. Well, I also like as soon as they get in there, it's like they they walk in the they walk in the room and immediately Harry is just like confuse it. And it's like like 
it's the first time Harry's like really like in his element, like I'm problem solving in a dark magic situation. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, this is just a, it's just a troll in the bathroom, but like he does immediately like assume the role of like the leader and like start barking orders at like Ron, who is just like immediately starts doing what he says. And right. like, they do get to the bottom of it, um, which is good. But I do, what I love about this particular passage is that. Yeah. It's so if you watch the movie, the way this goes down is that Harry's, you know, you know, choke holding the troll or something sticking his wand up its nose very yeah. effectively and Ron is over there and Hermione like coaches him through it. She says swish and flick and then Ron does it and like knocks out the troll. But in the book, what actually happens is that Hermione cowers in fear and Ron does it all by himself. End of story. <laughs> Yeah, this is it seemed like this was like a classic um, like film decision, which was that like they, they take a lot of moments where like Ron actually does like manage to shine through a little yeah. bit. And and again, like, you know, we, we I mean, we're kind of far off from really like delving into it too much. But like Ron's wand here is actively like working against him. At least if you like dig deep into the lore, like, you know, right. that his particular wand would and core like that. He he because he has his brother Charlie's wand. Yeah, uh, which again, my theory is that because Charlie went to study dragons, he created his own wand or at the very least harvested his own dragon heartstring. Sure. That he then was able to use for his new wand. That's, sure. That's my particular that thought as to why Charlie would choose a new wand at all, um, which most of the time is not necessary. Um, but like th this is like one of those things where like Ron's like inability to perform good magic for his first couple of years is in, in large part due to the fact that he is fighting against a wand that does not want to work properly for him. Yeah. Um, so kind of a big win for him because he, he not only is like under extreme pressure has not successfully done this spell before, um, but is also, you know, dealing with a, the sort of wand that's tied one hand behind his back. So he pulls it off. They knock out the troll. Um, and we start to get the setup here for, um, you know, the, the arrival of all of the, you know, professors, yep. um, where Quirrell continues his, his spectacular acting. It says Quirrell took one look at the troll, let out a faint whimper and sat down quickly on a toilet, clutching his heart. Yeah, um, it's we, like it's yeah, it is good misdirect here because he could be just acting or he could be like, you know, he could be reacting in this exact way because he's upset that his plan failed. That, you know, that's like he's true. afraid of Voldemort is what he's actually afraid of right now. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I find kind of interesting about this is that like, um, you know, then Hermione sort of like steps in mm -hmm. uh, and she sort of like starts to at least what is described as a lie. But it says, please, Professor McGonagall, they were looking for me. Um, I went looking for the troll because I thought I could deal with it on my own, you know, because I've read all about them. And so like that portion of it is a lie. Yeah. Like Hermione was was crying because of them in the right. first place. But otherwise, the rest of this is actually reasonably accurate. They were looking for her. Right. You know, like Yeah, like, that part is true. Yeah, that's I mean that's that's like exactly, yeah. you know, if they hadn't found me, I'd be dead now. And it's like that's also true. Harry stuck his wand up its nose. Ron knocked it out with his own club. That's also true. Also true. Um, you know, they didn't have time to catch anyone. It was about to finish me off when they arrived. Also true. Yep. Um when they, but it says Harry and Ron looked as though the story wasn't new to them. It's like, guys, that that is very nearly what just happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the the underlying reason why Hermione is in the bathroom is the only piece of the story that's actually been changed at all. Right. Yeah. That, that she went to go hunt it down by herself. Yeah. Um, there's also when Snape arrives there, it says Snape gave hey, Harry a swift piercing look, which I was like, I just made note of. I was like, what, did he do like a quick legilimens on him in that moment? Like what happened? Like, oh. can I read it from your mind? Like. Can he go like just confirm with Dumbledore later? Like, here's what happened, Professor, well, or you something. Know, it, I mean, if that's the case, it almost feels like this is again a situation where where it's the same as like Ron sort of like resentfully taking Hermione's advice on something because what Snape would see is that Harry and Ron did successfully show up and did successfully save Hermione. Yeah. Ooh, um, you know what though? This is this sentence as I'm thinking about it is a, almost a little clue that Snape is not the villain either. Oh, because yeah. because when Harry first gets there at the Great Hall and like locks eyes with Snape, that's when his scar hurts. Yes. And this is them doing it again. Snape gave Harry a swift piercing look and then Harry looked at the floor. So it sounds like they locked eyes and then he like looked away, but his scar does not hurt this time. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good because point. You could have maybe pieced that together, I suppose. Right. Yeah. Right. No, that's very interesting. But I, I do. I do like your legitimacy thought as well, because yeah. I feel like that's something that like once you know that Snape's had this ability the whole time, it's like you have to imagine that this is just like 
Like Snape is constantly wanting to catch Harry in the act. Right. But he knows Harry is always breaking the rules because he can just read Harry's mind and know that he's doing it. Right. Um, so that certainly seems to be the case. I do. I, this is like another one of those interesting moments though from McGonagall where she deducts five points from Miss Granger only to give to the points back to um, Ron and Harry. Yeah. Sort of like an interesting like like uh, like ledger that she's holding. It's like, well, that's five points from you. Now, five points to both of you. And right. It's like, it's almost like one of those things where she could have just awarded them both five points, like as a collective, like um, right. Ron, you have earned five points or whatever, but I don't know. Yeah, I think it's kind of the, the point system again continues to be like a little bit interesting here. Yeah, it also just seems like five points isn't enough to be it seems like she should have taken more from it just seems like maybe it all would have evened out the same, but it also just feels like five isn't enough to have taken from Hermione and it's not enough to have awarded Harry and Ron. Yeah. Yeah. This, again, yeah. this goes back to like the first year thing that where it's like, I wonder if on some level, like, you know, in, in everyday, like, because I mean, we, we know that they take like single points from first year. So yeah. it's like, is five points almost like the maximum you could or could not award shy of being the headmaster who was able to just hand out fifties as well. No, because McGonagall takes 50 points from You're all right. three of them later on so You're it could be it right. could be more yeah yep. yeah and that's just for being out of bed right when she takes it from the next time right this seems worse yeah or better, this seems worse and better yeah so it doesn't seem like the five is unusual uh here at this point and the i mean harry i mean ron complains about the same thing he says we should have gotten more than 10 points <laughs> I'm like i'm like i'm with you man yeah yeah i, yeah, I totally agree um so anyway though yeah as, as we trudge forward though the the fun and kind of exciting into this particular chapter is the is, is the phrase but from that moment on hermione grager became their friend there are some things you can't share without ending up liking each other and knocking out a 12-foot mountain troll is one of them i know i Yay. love it i, I love know it. the golden trio has been formed and it took, Boom. More, it took more than half the book to get it there. It really does. Yeah, you're now we're, we're at chapter 11 and finally Hermione is part of the group proper. Yes. yes. So it's very interesting. Um, what, what I also find to be kind of interesting about how Hermione has been like portrayed up until this point is um, it's not... Like you know how like it's uh, it's almost the case that like all Slytherins are like, like pig-headed or, or you know like they all have like names that seem kind of like hard just like or, rude or something yeah. It, yeah 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 it's like hermione has not exactly been depicted out of character so far this is almost more like a matter of allegiance because i feel like hermione stays pretty true to even how we've seen her up until this point like following rules continues to be something that's important to her she continues to be you know like like more knowledgeable or you know if you want to call her a know-it-all um moving forward but like it's it's sort of like the underlying um way in which she now interacts with the other has this like respect involved right so I, I think it's actually like pretty like pretty well crafted for for Hermione you know up until this up until this point you know yeah the, it's like she's finally able to like check herself and it's like there are times where breaking the rules is the right thing to do yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely so yeah well it's, um, it's it's worth it to lie on their behalf because they saved my life exactly yeah exactly so very exciting stuff golden trio has been forged yay um, and that'll round off chapter 10 Halloween for for us. It will. That will uh, round it off. What did you think of the chapter art for this chapter, Ben? Oh, it is if we go back to the front, the first page here, it's basically just the troll dragging his club around. I mean, I thought it looks like it looks pretty much exactly like the chapter describes it, but I always think in this particular chapter art, he looks just like kind of happy. Like the, the troll does look like like a little bit more um, lovable maybe um then then like you would sort of imagine a troll to be i also always sort of love and i mean i don't know, i have no idea why but like you know when when uh harry gets like the troll bogeys you know on his uh on his wand he it says i think that he like wipes it off on the troll's trousers and this i, don't, I have literally no idea what fascinates me so much about the fact that like within the troll community as as like you know, dim as they may be, they have still been able to like fashion garments. Yeah, they still have pants. They still have pants or whatever. And I also, I, yeah, I know. I'm just noticing the vest for the first time as I'm looking at it. Like this troll really got dressed. I mean, he is wearing pants with a belt even like went as far as that and then not only put on a shirt but also added the vest right i mean like that's fashion this, this guy is like he's he the, i know he's like it's how it's an occasion it's halloween i'm about to go torment the castle it's gonna be great yeah 
Yes, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, he's layering. Yeah. yeah. So no wonder he looks like he's in such a good mood. It's like, uh, yeah, I, I like the chapter art in this one. It's fun. It's I, fun. I like the chapter art. Yeah, it's yeah. a good one. It's a good That's one. Good. Um, and I am, I am also very excited as we turn the page uh, and look, look forward to chapter eleven, which will be titled Quidditch. Oh, I know. I always love the Quidditch matches in the books. Like it's very fun reading what's happening. Like just I, I get invested in the games. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It'll be curious to see how how it plays out from like a um, an analysis standpoint mm-hmm. though, is, is there as much to take away from from the quidditch chapter we'll have to wait and see we shall have to wait and see would meantime, you like to hear a review i would love to i would excellent love to. all right so um we got a review um just yesterday as i'm reading this from shark attack 117 nice i know five reading. stars five stars they said absolutely phenomenal hey brother love your show on youtube amazing podcast i have a suggestion for what if what if barty crouch was able to get to dumbledore you guys are the best voice for commentating harry potter and a lot of other stuff too on your show also i drive uber and this podcast has really helped me stay focused and listen to something while i drive it's amazing to hear your thoughts i wish i was able to contribute some of my own thoughts on the Harry Potter world. So one, I love that whoever gets in your Uber has to listen to this podcast. That's, That's amazing. amazing. That's yep. Thank you for spreading the word. Yes. Great, great way to do it. Yes. And great. What if as um, what what if Barty Crouch had gotten to Dumbledore? Because it's like uh, in many ways, there's no almost no reason he couldn't have just. Yeah, I mean, he's around Dumbledore all the time. It's giving ahead a little goblet fire. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's a very good question because I mean, this is this is sort of like one of those one of those moments where like the the like you know the phrase like you know don't don't shoot the messenger or whatever but in this case the messenger does not make it um and and barty crouch jr has sort of like turned the tide on his father you know who is then now sort of like kind of kind of like just lost in the you know the forbidden forest yeah and, and oh gosh maybe i'm not even i was thinking what i you know what i was reading this question as if what if barty crouch jr had been able to like kill dumbledore but oh. i suppose the question is what if barty crouch senior had been able to like tell Dumbledore yeah. that Barty Crouch Jr. had escaped and was alive. Ooh. Oh, man, that is a much better question. Okay, it, it's a great better. question. Yeah, no. That so I, I mean that. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 certainly something that I think you could you could delve into pretty aggressively to be like because because the, the big question in, in sort of like when we go into um, some of the facets of like Dumbledore's big plan mm-hmm. and everything to do with um, like how what am I trying to say here? Um, how how Dumbledore is like constantly like really aware of everything that's happening in the castle. I mean, even even what we know eventually from Deathly Hallows is that from the very beginning, you know, uh, of the school year, Dumbledore tells Snape, "Keep an eye on Quirrell for me, won't you?" Which w- basically suggests that like throughout the whole first book, Dumbledore knows he has a double agent living, yeah. breathing, teaching in his school. Right. Like I don't. I don't. I would. Suspect he doesn't know as much as Voldemort is living on the back of his head. Uh, maybe not. Like maybe yeah. he's more like like generally suspicious. I mean, Harry speculates at the end of this uh, at the end of this very novel that we're reading right now that you know I I, I feel like uh, Dumbledore knows everything that goes on inside these walls. You know, yeah, to, to some extent or another. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which which again is a very a very curious thought as to like how much does he know? Is I don't going think on. he knows every everything. Like he certainly has no idea how serious Black is breaking into the castle in a few years. That's true. That's you true. Know? And he does seem genuinely shocked that that Mad Eye Moody. And maybe this is like one of those things where like Dumbledore has so much faith in Mad Eye as a wizard. Uh, you know, inside of Book Four, that that he doesn't think to question you know, the possibility right. that he could have been like overtaken. Yeah, like Voldemort's trying to use Dumbledore's like ability to trust people against him. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 particularly interesting because, I mean, it would it would probably I mean, it would ward off at the very least the fact that Moody is the one who takes the cup to the middle of the maze. I mean, so, they, yeah, I mean, at that point. Yeah, oh, I guess they still wouldn't know it's Moody, would he? Even if he knew Barty Crouch Jr. was like loose true right so it doesn't necessarily mean that he would even like be able to sniff it out right but he would be suspicious of the fact that somehow some way somebody um you know was able to get harry's name inside of the goblet right you know and and that's the type of thing he almost certainly is aware that barty crouch jr is the culprit for the goblet of fire yes yeah and and then it's like that but how did he get into the school like he must have been there. 
He must be there somehow. But then, then I, this, this is like where it's like you have to credit Dumbledore's wisdom enough with the with the thought of he's able to suss out a lot of things. Yeah, who's new this year? Right, exactly. So, yeah. But then it's like there's all those like like Karkaroffs there, you know. True. Like all- he is investigating Karkaroff and Ludo Bagman and stuff at the same time. So it's like, hmm, was it one of them? Is one of them? Yeah, I guess we yeah, get could he. Yeah, what do, what do you think Polyjuice Potion was at play? I don't know. I guess he could put, if he put like Snape on alert that someone was making Polyjuice, because Snape realizes that Polyjuice Potion ingredients are stolen from him. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so it'd be like, I, does he does he go to Dumbledore with that information? I can't remember. I don't know. He complains to Harry about it. He does. Yeah, like swing flies, boom sling. Someone skin. is making polyjuice potion. Feels possible. Feel, and I mean, does. again, this is like where you don't assume that Snape would necessarily be telling everything to Dumbledore, but when you know that Dumbledore is acting alongside Snape so directly, it's like it seems very possible that they might be having meetings that be like someone's stealing polyjuice potion yeah well this what if okay so this this what if really goes back to so if barty crouch jr had been able to get to dumbledore it's because bar it's if barty crouch senior had been able to tell dumbledore like that would have happened if barty crouch jr didn't have the map right like the reason he's able to interfere is because he has taken the marauders map from harry oh so the real question is what if he doesn't take the map because then Harry still has the map and would know that Barty Crouch Jr. is the bad guy. Maybe. Yeah, we're gonna the, we're, yeah, who knows? We're yeah. gonna need to go spend more time with it. Anyway, yeah. it's a great it's a great question. Who was who was our who are our reviewer here? Shark? Um it I don't know if it's a Shark Attack 117. Shark Attack 117. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um well thank you so much for a very thoughtful question. I mean, we got to just keep a lookout because I feel like this could certainly be a video sometime. In the I know it could be. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good one to break down. And I'm surprised I'm, I, it, it's amazing to me that you know it as it always is with the wizarding world that we keep finding new ways to discuss the story. I know, so, yeah, very fun. Um, but anyway, guys, thank you so much much as ever and until next time we will see you through the Gryffindor Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 11, Quidditch. Ooh. Excellent intro today. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really top top shelf. Yeah, I I really tried to, um, you know, hone in on my... um, my introduction, my host voice. No, it was good. Yeah, yeah. I could tell. Yeah, you've been working mm-hmm. on it clearly. Right, yes. Clearly. Beth, last night I've been reading, as you know, I've been reading Harry Potter to my son, Luke, and like I came downstairs and she was like, I just wanted to tell you, I heard you were doing like McGonagall's voice and I was like really impressed. Like you sounded really good. And I was like, <laughs> well, thank you. Wow. Uh, me, McGonagall. That, that well, is high praise. I know. I was like, you almost went out of your way to tell me that. So thank you so much. And now um, feel, I'll, I'll see if I can summon it the next time McGonagall has a line in the book because I realized I just set myself up for total failure. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like, this wait is, a minute. It's like night, night. Hold yeah. on. <laughs> Would you like to demonstrate for us? Or um, uh, <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Are you sweating? All just know or? that my wife is impressed with me. Yeah, there we go. There yeah, we go. my we wife thinks I'm cool. There you go. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's a good T-shirt. That's a good T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that being said, yeah, uh, chap- chapter 11, the chapter that is Quidditch. Quidditch. Um, I personally find to be a spectacular chapter. Oh. Um, it, it does a really uh, splendid job of, of both progressing. Well, let me back that up. I would say it does a really splendid job of telling a Quidditch match, making it fun and engaging for us, the reader, mm-hmm. while also progressing the plot. It does. So yeah, I, it does. I think that's the that's the proper order to deliver that in. Yeah, and the chapter, sort of like last week, the chapter is broken up into two sections. Basically, the front half is Snape takes Harry's Quidditch book and Harry tries to get it back, and then we just have the Quidditch match. Yeah, so th- this chapter in particular, I think, is... is um, the other thing I would say about it is that it is slightly heavy-handed to the tune of... Like, it, it had never really occurred to me until we read it through, like, in this way before, because normally, I mean, 
mean, if you just read, um, I mean, you can finish this book in usually like four hours or something. Yeah, like I mean, if you, if you really wanted to, this is an easy book to finish in one day. So yeah, not, the fact that we're taking 17 weeks to do it, you know, no big deal. Yeah, no. So, but, but I would say the thing that I've noticed is that like up until this point, we know that like Snape clearly doesn't like Harry. He's clearly kind of like, you know, like needled him a couple of times. First day of class. There's like the moment with like the, the scar hurting, you know, that type of thing. But yeah. um, for the most part, up until this point, though, we haven't had lots of other super major incidents where um, we're like kind of led to believe that Snape is like that nefarious. Like maybe he doesn't like Harry, but this is the chapter that's sort of like point your suspicion at Snape. Yeah, yeah. Like, they definitely really try and paint Snape as the bad guy. Like last chapter, he like, you know, was headed towards the third floor corridor and it's like, oh, and then maybe he was limping a little bit. But what is that enough to like cast suspicion on him or anything? Maybe just a little, but now it's getting, yeah, very like, look at Snape, look at Snape. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So th- th- this feels like the chapter where, where um, like, the sleight of hand is really occurring, and I would say not even so sleight of hand. It's sort of like... Harry at this point in time is actively being interfered with uh, and, and even the fact that the chapter leads with like this little segment of Harry being out on the grounds and you know like reading from you know Quidditch through the ages and losing five points from Gryffindor and then like you know Harry being like well I'm going to go cr- try to get my book back and discovering uh, Snape receiving bandages from Filch of all oh people. Oh my gosh yeah well, yeah we'll we'll get back to that part because that was so stupid like especially like this this uh, many parts about this chapter I feel like did not age well as like maybe more of the world became established. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that that's a fair way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. anyway, well, let's let's do our normal thing. We can we can kind of skate through the chapter as we go. Yeah, uh, pick out all the stuff that kind of stands out to us and analyze as we do. So we will. so I mean, first paragraph, Ben Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs windows defrosting broomsticks on the Quidditch field. <laughs> if you're if you're, <laughs> if you're yeah, <laughs> nothing about this sentence to me makes sense. One, it sounds like Hagrid's doing magic, which he should not be allowed to do. Two, why are there broomsticks just left willy nilly on the Quidditch field? Three, even if that's the case, why aren't you just bringing them inside? Like, not what? What is going on? <laughs> yeah, why? Why would the why? The, I mean, this goes back to our question from earlier, uh, from from last week, where we talked about like the um, the up thing. Yeah, you know, it's almost like like is there some type of uh, ceremony attached to the game of Quidditch, wherein the night before all players go and like drop their broomsticks in the place that they intend to, you know, like the, like take off from or something like that like why why would they be all left outside yeah no i don't i have no idea to me it just sounds like out on the quidditch field there's a rack of brooms that students can come just grab or something maybe, maybe they're just like the yeah. school brooms but even then like even later on i think even in this book there's like a, a section where it's like there's a broom shed yeah that's the yeah. thing yeah is i mean the other thing is that like broomsticks are made of wood um right. and like the idea of leaving anything wood really so this is the thing like the people maybe don't understand about wood in general is that like wood doesn't rot simply from water exposure it rots when it's exposed to water and then dry temperatures and then water and then dry temperatures over and over and over again but if you sink a log underwater it doesn't decay it's like this is how you get like petrified wood right is from what wood, wood all, just sustaining underwater also presumably all of these broomsticks are like very intentionally made as broomsticks for flight and have some amount of like impervious charms on them yes so that they would not be subject to the elements I, you know magic is at play people right right I, Hagrid I, I'm curious and I can't remember if this is a characteristic characteristic of the firebolts or not but maybe it's got like an anti-icing oh does spell it spell on it I it, think so for like high altitudes for high altitudes yeah. yeah yeah I believe it I think it does but I would have to I'd have to fact check myself on that one um, th- it also brought about I, I just because I was thinking about the because um, I highlighted the exact same sentence yeah. um, because I was thinking about broomsticks it reminded me of a video we made once upon a time that was whether or not broomsticks have cores in the same way that uh, wands wands do. do. Yeah. And I believe the conclusion that we came down to is they almost certainly need to um, have a core inside of them unless the enchantment is just something else entirely. But it, it feels like you're kind of channeling your magic through the broomstick a little bit. I think right like otherwise it's just what a piece is, of wood but like I mean but like then there's the up thing though it's like Harry th- says they're more like horses or something that's a good point yeah they can like sense fear which does sound like wands like wands have a certain like um like intelligence or sentience about them yeah so that kind of sounds like it so it was yeah that that sounds uh, pretty plausible to me that they would have some kind of core because otherwise like is it just that wizards could 
pick up any stick with bristles on it and fly? <laughs> That's the question because yeah. I mean, in like what we know, and I think what Ollivander tells us is that in in, Ch- in uh, Deathly Hallows, rather, I think is that like technically a um, uh, a witch or wizard could channel their magic through any object. Yeah, but like wands in particular are that much more capable of doing it and, and establish like a, like an ongoing relationship with the wizard themselves. Um, but to me, what that says, you know, like if, if James Potter's wand again is, is made of mahogany and it's just a stick of mahogany, then it's just a stick. It doesn't have like the, the otherwise infused magical property that comes from the wand core. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it takes both to sort of like determine it as like a magical object. And so I, in my mind, the logic stands to reason with a broomstick. It's the same way. Like, you know, I mean, you could go and pick up any, you know, like, like, yeah, like broom from like, like a muggle broom, for yeah, example. Yeah. You could know? they just pick up any muggle broom and fly on it? it? It seems like on some level, like you, you maybe could, it would be highly inefficient or like maybe like it couldn't even get you like physically off the ground, but like maybe you could channel like, a little bit of lift, right? Sure, through it or something you like that. You could like hover or something, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um. So I, anyway, I mean, not that it really matters one way or another, but I like to think that yeah, that there's that there's cores tucked inside of the broomsticks. I like the, yeah, I yeah. like that head cannon as well. Uh, just moving just a little bit down the page, there it mentions uh, a Harry's nervous about the upcoming match, and it says if Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the house championship, which is like an interesting sentence to me because so they're against Slytherin and if they beat Slytherin, they'll move up into second behind who because like it is established that Slytherin is typically the, is like at the end of the year Slytherin Slytherin is, has been has the, the most points. Yeah. They've won the cup the last seven years in a row. So it's like presumably if they beat Slytherin, they'll move into second place behind Slytherin. I, that, I mean, I guess it's possible Hufflepuff, Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw is in first at this point. I, I, yeah, I suppose yeah. that is possible. It's still early in the year. I mean, we're just yeah. inside of November, I think, at this point in time. But either way, either way, it doesn't. It also is uh, curious because later on, like the specific amounts that you win by like matter more to the house championship. So it's like if we win no matter what, we'll move up into second. Whereas if we lose, we won't because it sounds like if you like later on, there's like this whole chapter where it's like we need to be winning by 50 points, but or maybe I don't know, but then this is in relation to the house championships. So it's like, do you get as many points for the house as you score in the game? That's the thing. Yeah, is that it seems like it seems like that would weight the house cup drastically towards whichever team had the best Quidditch or whichever house had the best Quidditch team. Because you know, even even at the end of the, the book, I think that like, you know, Slytherin has approximately 600 points, which is like what um, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville are able to like overcome and, and take over yeah. with the win. But like if you win each, if you win three Quidditch matches, that alone, just by catching the snitch, is 450 points. Right. Which, so that doesn't like, feel right. That doesn't feel right. I guess, right, okay, yeah. okay. Here's what must be happening. Okay. Is that either at this point, Hufflepuff or Ravenclaw, I guess even Slytherin could be winning. It doesn't matter. That Gryffindor is presently in third place at the moment. In the house championship. In the house championship. And that by winning a Quidditch match, you earn a set number of points that is unrelated to how many points you actually score on the pitch on the pitch okay. for the house championship. Whereas then the Quidditch cup matters how many points you actually scored in the game. But I think that that's more of like a tiebreaker type of situation, which okay. like with only 14 sure. seems plausible. Yeah, there's only six matches all year, right? Yeah, so, so it seems it seems like so maybe it's like if Gryffindor wins Gryffindor house will just get 50 points for having won. for having one. Okay, yeah, yeah something I mean, like that. We, we don't know that for for a verified fact, but that to me that seems like the best interpretation yeah. of the information we have a set number that will move them into second place. So they're losing by whatever the difference is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All right. We've 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 we figured that out. I think I think uh, let's see. Next up, Harry has uh, Quidditch through the ages, which fun fact is another like you can actually buy Quidditch through the ages. I think we had a, a copy of it when we were kids. We did. Yeah. So yeah. back in like the way, way, way back when version, there was both a copy. Uh, there were these like little like leaflet looking books. They were yeah. kind of small, but we had both the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt's Commander. And then we also had Quidditch through the ages, um, which is written by. Oh, I, I thought it was in the book here somewhere. Anyway, but it, I don't I, I can't remember exactly who it is offhand. 
But uh, we did have both of these books as kids, and it was kind of it was kind of fun and interesting, just to, like leaf through it. And obviously now in the in the present day, there's like much more bona fide versions of both yes, of there those are. Books. But I remember thinking that like even as kids, that, like when we got these sort of like leaflet versions of the books, because like. Uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is one of Harry's textbooks, and it was always like Hermione read all of their textbooks cover to cover, and I was like, oh my gosh, what? Like, I don't think I ever read every page of a textbook I owned ever, but then it was like, oh, 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 oh wizard textbooks are like 30 pages long, <laughs> and they're like on paperback, like, oh, well, okay, Hermione's not seeming so impressive all of a sudden. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, it's, if anything, the other students is like, guys, they're like 30 pages. Yeah, you're like, point. guys, come on, you could knock out like the entire course, the entire first year's worth of textbooks in like an afternoon if you really tried. Right, yeah, just just crack those books open. Crack them in, yeah. guys. Um, either way, I did I did underline the 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul. Yeah. Uh, just because I thought that was a fun fact. Oh, on, on Quidditch Through the Ages, this was my original thought. I remember when Fantastic Beast was announced as a film series. Yeah. Is I was like, oh, does that mean that like the next one will be Quidditch Through the Ages? Like, like, like for whatever reason that is like the only thing that made sense to me is that like because those two books came out together and one of them's now a movie and how great would it be to have like a wizarding world sports movie that would be really cool yeah I would be all in for like the like the ultimate underdog story I know of like the yeah like I mean I've been watching uh, welcome to Wrexham yeah. you know about like sort of like league five uh, if like you know like Welsh football, right? Sure, you yeah. know English football, uh, where they're like a like a like a sub league, the Champions League, I think is what it's called. Um, and you know, like they're they're trying to like get promoted and and work their way up the you know the ladder and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd be all for Quidditch through the ages, yeah, like like film series. I know, like we don't even need you don't even need it to be like some crazy dark wizard, big world threatening problem or anything. Just like just it's Quidditch. just a sports epic. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just about it's like Miracle on Ice, but 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 brooms in hail. Or something. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Or we can just call it Quidditch Through the Ages. That's Quidditch Through the Ages. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, we get the, the reference in Quidditch Through the Ages that, um, let's see here, most serious Quidditch accidents seem to happen to Seekers in particular, which I feel like they really like harken on. Yeah. Um, which, as we know, as Harry goes through his, uh, through his years of playing Quidditch, he certainly does sustain some injuries. But they almost, they, they don't always really seem Quidditch related necessarily he just gets harmed I mean, even in this very chapter like someone is actively trying to buck him off of his broom yeah like he never like he rarely gets injured in quidditch because of the game it's like because of interference because of, yeah because then you yeah know, because next, dementor show up or, or because the bludger is literally cursed to hunt him yes exactly yeah. <laughs> yep yep uh but then we get the uh let's see here uh, people rarely died playing Quidditch. Referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> what I think is interesting is like, like they didn't say there was an instance where a referee showed up years later or, or months D- later in the Sahara Desert. It's just like when they vanish, they go to the it's, same show, yeah. it's like it's happened on multiple occasions. Referees have disappeared and shown up at the Sahara Desert. We don't know how it happens. We don't know how it happens. Yeah, um, it's out, that to me reads like whoever was like whatever whoever was making them disappear was the the same culprit over and over. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, I, it's it, not just like Sahara Desert spell. <laughs> Get out of here, ref. <laughs> So, okay. 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 Well, Andy's gone. And why not? Why not? Yep. Um, then we get our first glimpse of Hermione's uh, like bright blue bell um, flame, which yep. I feel like she uses. Uh, I think on numerous occasions throughout the saga. Yeah, she absolutely does. Yeah, it's still like one of her little signature spells here. It is uh, baffling to me that like they're they just have a little fire outside. One that if it's so cold that they are outside, why not just go inside? Like they're just standing. They're not even standing talking. They're all standing, not facing each other with their backs to the fire. <laughs> um, but then there also says like they were sure it wouldn't be allowed. And I'm like, wh- why would it not be allowed at a school of magic to have a little magic fire? Well, I, I mean, you're not supposed to have like do magic in the corridors. We know that from like the very beginning. So. I guess. I mean, this is outside, but this is like one of those things where it's like it's like, yeah, it, it really does seem like using magic almost just about anywhere is pretty much forbidden. Yeah, like, it's, excuse me, unless you are learning how to do the magic, don't do it. Yeah, either in the comfort of your own homes as a trained adult or in class, but that's it. That's it, which I know sounds ridiculous, but that's also probably like like driving a car. It's like you can either do it while you're training specifically or or like as a licensed adult, like yeah. a licensed adult. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to be fair, I guess that actually does track um, either which way. Yeah. So they're not supposed to they're not supposed to have it, which I guess demonstrates just a little bit that Hermione is like kind of a bit more open to bending the rules. I guess so. Yeah, it does say that, too, that she uh, was 
Uh, her mind had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules since Harry and Ron had saved her from the mountain troll, and she was much nicer for it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Um, after that, though, we we do get the discovery that like Snape Snape is uh, specifically limping, uh, and and they're kind of like, oh, I wonder what's 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 going on with that, um, which then obviously promptly comes up like two and a half paragraphs later, uh, where Harry is back up in the Gryffindor common room, and he's just like, man, I really just want to like distract myself with some good old fashioned Quidditch through the ages. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's just <laughs> this whole thing seems contrived. It's like <laughs> Harry was outside and Snape came and took his book. Harry wanted his book back, so he came and discovered Snape. C- contrived is the right word. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's set up specifically just so that Harry has a re- like this. This feels like the bit that like like it, it's just like hmm. How do I kind of progress this go like this this plot forward a little bit? I've got it. I know we <laughs> need Harry to be really suspicious of Snape. So what if he sees him trying to fix his wounds and then it's like yeah. So he. Harry walks in trying to get uh, the book back. <laughs> God, the, I love Harry going up to the staff room. Knocks, no one's there, and he's like, "Perhaps Snape had left the book in there." I was like, "Why? Sure, okay." Yeah, this, yeah. I, I remember there <laughs> being like a teachers' try. lounge, you know, going through like elementary school and yeah. stuff like that. Like the, I, I don't even know if I ever knew where they were, but I feel like the existence of the of the lounge itself was yeah. like, you know. It's like, yeah, that's some like mythical, magical place, right? But the other yeah. thing too, to me, about Hogwarts in particular is that, near as I can tell, all of the professors just simply live in the castle. Yeah, and so the idea of them ever going to like the teachers' lounge just seems maybe it's not that far fetched. Like you know, you got to go and have a place to have a cup of Joe or yeah, something. somewhere to microwave your fish lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now here's a question: Which Hogwarts professor is microwaving fish lunch? Oh my gosh! Who is it? That's Trelawney. You know, Trelawney <laughs> she just like comes down from the tower and is like, "Hello." <laughs> is anyone using the microwave? It's like <laughs> everyone's like, "We don't even have a microwave, Sybil." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Electronics don't work here. McGonagall is just like like I, I could see McGonagall knowing that there is a microwave in the teacher's lounge and actively hating it. Yeah, like, yeah. who put this here? And I, no, I'm not having it. I'm not having Mm-mm. it. Anyway, when what Harry discovers upon entering the teacher's lounge um, is that Snape and Filch are in there alone, mm-hmm. and uh, Snape is holding his robe above his knees, and Filch is handing him bandages. Yeah, even the fact that Snape is like openly talking to Filch, saying, "How are you supposed to keep your eyes?" and all three heads at once. It's like, I'm like, there is no, this doesn't sound like Snape at all. This is the least Snape sentence I've ever heard. I ever. know like nothing, like nothing about this sentence may nothing about the situation to me makes sense. One that Snape and Filch are hanging out together at all. There you go. It's yeah. already weird if Harry just walked in and it was Snape and Filch be like, oh, what do you think about the students today? Oh, I hate them again. I do. <laughs> like they're just We're not such hanging best out. Buds. I know Two that specifically what they're doing is changing Snape's bandages in the staff lounge of all places. Like why is it? Why are they doing this in Snape's office or whatever? Because like he's clearly trying not to be seen and this is a place where any teacher could walk in. Right. Alternatively, just simply the hospital wing. Not, well, I, I guess you could argue he doesn't want like the injury to be discovered by maybe the other teachers or something and like Madame Pomfrey would know then you think in the teacher's lounge is the best place to keep that's exactly what I'm saying yeah, though it's, it's like yeah I mean I, I mean I understand where you're coming from but just yeah I, I yeah mean, just I don't, I don't think so there's that okay. on top of that that like later I mean, this is another one of those situations where it's like maybe the world just wasn't as established yet or something but like later on when uh, Harry hits Draco with Sectum Sempra this like dark magic spell that like slices him with a sword Snape arrives on the scene and is able to heal the spell like instantly and this is like, like a dark magic spell like at once with his wand is able to like save Draco's life. This is Snape is suffering a dog bite apparently for several days and hasn't been able to heal it like himself magically like uh, either uh, well, Snape did invent Sectum Sempra, so maybe I, he knows the counter curse. I suppose you could argue that he knows the counter curse, but like Snape seems like a good enough wizard that he could heal a simple like bite wound. He is who Dumbledore goes to even after the um, he puts on the the Horcrux. Yeah, he ring. knows how to do that. Yeah, he knows how to solve that. So so there's that. All I can all I can assume, all I can surmise from this is that uh, Fluffy's like bite contains some sort of like. Absolutely horrendous venom in it. Ooh, 
Ooh, you know, kind of like, like Basiliski. Exactly. Like Basiliski or like Nagini or something because ah, like um, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Weasley yeah. gets bit by Nagini and it's like, yeah, he's like injured for a while until they could finally figure out how to heal it back up. And that's healers at St. Mungo's people yeah. whose actual career is like specifically doing that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I like that. So that that is my new. That's the only thing that makes sense to me is that if Fluffy bites you, it is like more than it is like a cursed bite of it's like of a bad sorts. Bite. Yeah, I bet Newt could do it. Newt's yeah. commander. Oh, well, of yeah. course, Newt yeah. could do it. Classic. Okay, Newt's the yeah. man, yeah. but he's in retirement. So anyway, um, so Snape obviously gets extremely mad uh, at Harry for for being there for witnessing this particular thing. But like that's the other thing that's happening inside of this chapter is that we're really starting to I mean, because we, we don't even have that much book left The the golden trio needs enough information to start tugging on the strings that will start to pull it all yeah. together. So oh. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. This <laughs> the last thing I feel like that doesn't make sense about Snape's bite is like why was he trying like okay so because Harry says he tried to get past a three headed dog at Halloween. That's where he was going when we saw him and it's like that's true. That is where he was going, but in like why why was Snape facing fluffy? You know like what was he doing in there? Like why why was he in a situation to get like bitten at all like because we know Quirrell didn't get past Fluffy. It wasn't like Snape was like, oh man, I got to follow Quirrell down the trap door and get past this dog too. Well, you don't think you know, I mean I, I, my my interpretation as you asked the question is that Quirrell did get past Fluffy. No, we know we didn't because oh, Hagrid he, hasn't li- hasn't let slip about the music yet. The music. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, he, right. so Quirrell doesn't know how to get past Fluffy. So clearly like He's there to cut Quirrell off, but does he just like go past the door and like wait for him or something? Yeah, like why not wait outside the door? (laughs) There's not a particularly good reason why why Snape would have to face Fluffy in this particular instance. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a a good point. Um, The other kind of irony here uh, is that he is struggling uh, with a multi-faced foe. Yeah, which Quirrell is also a multi-faced foe. Oh, that's true. That's funny. Yep. Yeah. So, kind of like, I mean, the specific th- the specific thing is how are you supposed to keep your eyes on all three heads at once? It's like it's, I don't even know. I've never caught that before. In but like, I almost wonder if that's supposed to be like a little nod, like more than one face, more than one face. Yeah. Be on the lookout. Okay. Okay. I yeah. like it. I also like Harry says, "I bet my broomstick he let that troll in." I'm just like, you'd have lost that bet, sir. Hand yeah. over that broomstick. I know. I know. Although he he's pretty close to the correct assessment. He is. Someone let in the troll. Yeah. To make a diversion, it just wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, Snape in particular, um, but yeah. So then, anyway, Harry starts to kind of like do the thing that Harry sometimes does, which is almost setting aside, you know, his daily high school existence in exchange for starting to wonder about like the bigger picture. Yeah, you know, like like what else is going on? Because you know he's he's basically um, he's basically struggling with his his nerves about Quidditch and essentially ends up like being distracted, saying Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with the same question, uh, what is which is like um, uh, what's he after and what's that dog guarding so this is this is just like another one of those sort of like innate inside of Harry situations where it's just sort of like you know it's like the, like as much as he might might love Quidditch it's like the thing that can distract him from Quidditch is justice right yeah you it's know, like I is, gotta figure out what Snape is up to yep yep what is what is going mm-hmm. on so anyway the next morning uh, kicks off and we know that uh, Harry is kind of having a very similar uh, morning to what Ron's first um, Quidditch match looks like same as Ron later on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like when Ron is eventually is it in year five? Yeah, it must be year five. Yeah, that he's that Ron's really nervous about Quidditch. It seems like they almost have. I'd be I'd be curious to compare the passages because yeah. I think that they are like darn near the same or at least yeah. the sentiment is very much the same. One of the things I noticed as, as we scroll down here is um, specifically we get a line from Seamus that says Harry you need your strength. Seekers are always the ones who get clobbered by the other team and then literally the next paragraph we get a line about Dean uh, that says uh, Ron and Hermione join Neville, Seamus, and Dean, the West Ham fan, up in the top row. Yeah, and I, this is kind of like interesting because I feel like Dean does ultimately come, become like a bigger part of the story, but like it almost feels like at this point in time, like the fact that like we're being reminded, like, oh, do you remember Dean? He's the one who is the likes, West Ham fan. That's like his defining characteristic. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like I, I <clears throat> tend to think of like, um, and maybe this is like Parvati and Lavender, sort of like are, are like a couplet. Yeah, you know, Seamus and Dean seem like they sort of like are are always 
representing ki- kind of similar like space inside of like the the, the Gryffindor Tower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, we also get uh, oh maybe we're not there yet, so I'll, I'll save my next thought there. It says the whole school seemed to be out in the stands. I always think it's funny that whenever there's a Quidditch match that Harry's playing in, it's like the whole school was there, but like at n- zero point ever is it like. You know, do you hear about Harry, Ron, and Hermione going to watch the Hufflepuff Ravenclaw match? I know. You know, like they, they, you never hear about them attending non Gryffindor matches. <laughs> it's so true. It's yeah. so true. Yeah. It's like there, there's literally no instances I feel like ever where, where we get almost anything other than like a score recap. Yeah. 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 Well, flattened by Hufflepuff in that last match. Um, as, as we move forward though, we get the, uh, the, um, the speech from Oliver Wood. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I totally marked down the exact same thing. It's yes. a good speech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great, great, great speech. It, it's it's ba- I, what does he even end up saying? Like, OK, men and women, this is it. The big one, the one we've been waiting for. <laughs> and then yeah, Fred and George like uh, basically immediately interrupt him. Yeah, so yeah. F- Fred uh, Fred says we know Oliver's speech by heart. We were on the team last year. This is one of the things I wrote a little note down about because I, I'm pretty sure Charlie was supposed to be at school last year and was seeker, uh, which means that Oliver possibly was like a underclassman captain of Charlie Weasley, like renowned oh, Quidditch seeker. I think it's been like two years since Charlie was there. You think so? Yeah. Okay. I think okay. we worked that out. Okay. At one point, but like, yeah, you're right. Like it says well, we memorized his, his speech and it's like the whole, the speech is this had they not been interrupted. The entire speech would have been this. Okay, man, this is the big one. The one we've all been waiting for. This is the best team Gryffindor's had in years. We're going to win. I know it. That would have been the whole speech. <laughs> like, no wonder you memorized it. It was one line. Yeah, there was, yeah. There, there's not a lot to say there. That's, that's not, like it's not a speech. And it's like to me, I was like, Oliver, be original, man. You're, you're using the same one sentence speech every game. Come on, right? Maybe maybe you need to maybe to work some a little more gusto. Yeah, into firing up your team there before the big game. I know. Um, oh, that was the other one that I said is is basically this is the best team Gryffindor has had in years. We're gonna win it. Um, and it seems like it was just about the same team. Um, I, I did write down Harry instead of Charlie, so maybe if Charlie had been two years out, that would make sense. But we do also learn that um, Alicia it, Spinett was a, a last year reserve. Yeah. So, oh um, yeah, I noticed that too because I was like, "There's no reserves on the team right now." Right, and it's interesting that it seems like the whoever was the seeker last year must have been a seventh year. Because it's not like oh, it's that you know you don't find out otherwise who it was. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I that I wrote down at the end of the chapter as well was just that like we know that Malfoy takes over as Slytherin uh, seeker in year two. Yeah. Um, which could mean that during Harry's first ever Quidditch match as a first year, he was going up against the seventh year. Oh, it could mean that. Yeah. 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 It, uh, it also would not surprise me if Lucius was just like, I don't care if there's a seeker already. Get him off the team. That's why I say, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I feel like it's like it's conceivable or it's just the Malfoys just throwing their weight around as right. always because they might do that. Um, on the note of what year everybody is, there's just another one of those like little uh, changes that has been made in the reprints since the original recording because I, I both read and listened to the chapter. Uh, Marcus Flint in the audiobook is referred to as a sixth year. Um, oh. However, in the book, he's a fifth year. Uh, I think the thing about this is that Marcus Flint is still the Slytherin captain all the way up to Harry's third year. And if yeah. he was a sixth year, that would make him an eighth year. No, he failed out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Had yeah. to redo a year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just just kind of sticking around. So um, I love Lee Jordan's commentary of the Quidditch matches. That's always one of my favorite things. Oh, same here. Yep. I wrote that down as well. Yep. I love, but uh, I thought this is very interesting that or not, not even super interesting, but like uh, he says, and the quaffle is taken immediately by Angelina Johnson to Gryffindor. What an excellent chaser that girl is and rather attractive too, <laughs> which I love that. It's like clearly it's like it makes it sound like Lee has like a little bit of a crush on Angelina, which is totally great, but I think it's funny though that he doesn't ask her to the Yule ball later on. That's so true. You know, like I mean, and there's time like Fred basically forgets to do it for a while. Yeah, and he just you sort know? of like, hey, do you want to go? And she's like, yeah, like, I'm yeah, in. I guess so. And I'm like, Lee, where were you, dude? Come on, man. Come on. That was your chance. I know. Yeah. Oh, well. 
No, I, I do love Lee Jordan. This was another one that I felt like when dad was reading us the books when we were a little kid. I feel like he, I feel like dad had fun with like the, the Lee Jordan oh, yeah. commentary, but there, there's like so many like good moments. And I, and I love the fact that McGonagall is like literally standing there over his shoulder. And I can just imagine hearing McGonagall's voice sort of like distantly echoing through the stadium yeah, through the as, stands. She's, <laughs> as she's like chastising him for everything he keeps saying. Um, but like yeah. she's, she's used to this by now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so she's like, I know. I know what I'm going to have to do. Mm-hmm. Then we get the uh, let's see here. What do they say about Fred and George? We- but he's blocked by a second bludger sent this way by Fred or George. We- Fred or George. Fred or George Weasley. Can't tell which. Nice play by the Gryffindor beater anyway. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's all such good stuff. And that's uh, like their best friend too. I know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever. Yeah. Which is always one of those things that like because you're watching this through the lens of like team Gryffindor. It's always like you sort of love that Lee Jordan is the commentator. But like if it was like a Slytherin commentator, it would be like the worst. Yeah. You know, I'm like what? No. Oh, what do you mean? You can't tell which one. Somebody needs to put a stop to this. You know, mm-hmm. it's ridiculous. No good. Anyway, um, th- then we we scroll down a little bit um, and we get a uh, change in perspective. This was actually I, I got halfway through this thought earlier and I changed gears where we're actually watching the plot unfold from um, Hermione, Ron and Hagrid's uh, like version of things yeah. through the stands. So that's it's like one of those rare instances where like you're not seeing it through Harry's perspective. Right. But then what Hagrid says is been watching from me hut, been watching from my hut, said Hagrid, patting a large pair of binoculars around his neck. But it isn't the same as being in the crowd. No sign of the snitch yet, eh? And this is like one of those things where like the game just started. So does he mean like he's been like he's been watching Quidditch from his hut like in years past or like since 30 seconds ago when the game started, he managed to like watch some of the game from his hut yeah. where he then blitzed his way. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like what have you been watching? Only yeah, like one thing has happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's so, like, yeah, if you if you've been watching from your hut, then you, you watch them catch the quaffle and then started walking at which point presumably you weren't watching because it's like I even wrote that it said been watching from me hut. I wrote how yeah I said, <laughs> I said like before today yeah. or yeah <laughs> like whatever Hagrid's in the stands. That's the point. Uh, no need to justify his existence there. I don't think yeah, no whatsoever. Yeah, although scrolling down. I thought oh, I just I just thought this was like an interesting thing was um, Harry thinks he sees the golden stitch, but he says once he caught a flash of gold, but it was just a reflection from one of the Weasley's wristwatches and I was like, well, it is interesting to me that the Weasley's who are apparently super poor. Uh, one of them owns a gold wristwatch and is wearing it during a sports match a sports match. Yeah. You know. I mean, during a sports ball, who doesn't wear their favorite Rolex during I, a sports play? No. Like you're wearing a metal watch in the middle of a game. That seems like it actually. I don't know. This feels like one of those things. Like they tell you not to wear like flashy jewelry while like while like snorkeling and stuff yeah. like that because it can sometimes like signal to like a, like a barracuda or yeah. something that like you know it's like hey that, that's like a shiny fish over there. Um, but it actually feels like wearing a gold watch in particular could be actively distracting in the exact way that it is in this. Scene. It does, yeah. Um, um, the other thing that's kind of interesting about that, and not to I mean, this this is totally just nitpicking. I'm I'm not actually upset about this particular detail, but um, we know that wizards typically are gifted a gold watch um, once they come of age. Yeah, it's like a tradition. Um, so like we we see this happen, and the Weasleys are obviously they have not come of age yet. So I mean the fact that they have a gold watch. I mean you could just have like a gold plated watch. Like people have gold for watches, sure, absolutely. You know, you know I I have very inexpensive, uh, or at the very least Alice has very inexpensive gold watches at her house that are not made of like proper gold, right? Like they're gold colored. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I guess you could have that. It doesn't feel like in the wizarding world they have gold colored things. It's just like it's gold. Gold is gold. It's, gold is gold. You know, yeah, yeah. Oh, one of the things that I that I thought was kind of interesting is that again, go back to Lee Jordan's commentating. It says Chaser Pusey uh, ducks two bludgers, two Weasleys and Chaser Bell um, and speeds toward. Wait a moment. Was that the snitch? Uh, and this is like it's like, man, it does. Why is Lee Jordan not been on the team if he, as the commentator, is spotting the snitch? I know. Yeah, it's, like, it's very impressive. He's all over it, and then I think he says that, and then it says the chaser seemed to have forgotten what they were supposed to be doing as they hung in midair to watch. It's like I was just like, guys, that's no excuse. Amateur hour over here. I know. Seriously. You cannot be distracted by the seeker seeing the snitch. You got to keep playing. You, you know, you got to play you, through that. Call yourself future professional athletes. I know exactly. You know who doesn't get distracted is Marcus Flint. Later on, he's like, "Hey, something's happening. Doesn't matter. I'm just going to score five goals real quick while no one's looking, which do count. Which do count. Yeah. yeah, I know. But if nobody's looking, then how how does anybody know that he's scoring goals? <laughs> 
masks. <laughs> Madam Hooch as a pair. I was like as soon as Harry's broom starts bucking. It's like the whole stadium is watching this and I'm like, what is Madam Hooch doing? Yeah, Clearly yeah. something is wrong with Harry's broom and she's like, you know what? He's going to sort that out. I need to make sure I'm keeping an eye on that quaffle. Everyone keeping score. Flint, you got it. Score, score, score. Score and also like apparently is there just no reset between scores? I guess I know I had the you exact know? same thought. Like, is he just throwing it through the hoop, running to the ground, picking it back up, running in the air, throwing it through the hoop, running to the ground, picking it back up? The thing and then I, Oliver's just sitting there like, huh? It's like, come on, Oliver, yeah. man! It's supposed to be the best team we've had in years. I know. Yeah, <laughs> all I, these guys I, just sitting ducks out there. <laughs> yeah, I think in general the the real point is is that Harry is never ever 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 the benefactor of uh, a, an adult being present. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it feels like always like Malfoy will be like picking on him and somehow Snape will come over and like like you know punish Harry for it. Yeah. Or if McGonagall <laughs> is present then it'll be like she'll only catch it once Harry pulls his wand out. Yeah. And be like Potter what are you doing? I know. And it's just like a oh, poor Harry. I know. It's just like gosh if anybody had been here 10 seconds sooner you would have seen mm, he was picking on me. Yeah. But seriously. Madam Hooch. Ha- Hagrid. Hagrid of all people who can't even ride brooms is sitting there telling Ron and Hermione that like no one can interfere with the broomstick unless it's dark magic or whatever like Hagrid knows enough about brooms that something dark is going on. Madam Hooch the broom expert and flying instructor and referee of this match does nothing even though it is super clear even to Hagrid that something bad is happening. That, that's the thing about this too. It's like I mean we, we said it like at the beginning of the chapter but it's like the whole school showed up for this particular thing like yeah like w- of all of the occasions to try to attack Harry it's like you are literally doing it with every available witness uh, except apparently Dumbledore <laughs> except apparently Dumbledore because because yeah. he's going to show up to the next match, and they're all like, oh, good thing Dumbledore will be there. Snape will never try to attack Harry now. That's a good which point. Which kind of implies that Dumbledore is not at this one. Right, right. Dumbledore, come on, man. Yeah. How do you miss this? How are you missing this? <laughs> Anyway, 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 yeah, no, no big deal. No big deal. Um, but yeah, so anyway, as we as we go forward, this was I talked about this a little bit, like I think going back to to flying lessons, but um, I think in the movie in particular, they show Neville's broom bucking in a very similar capacity to like what happens to Harry's, which I feel like almost like sets up this idea that like, oh, maybe brooms are just like malfunctioning and like Neville's just not very good at flying a broom. So right. like, when it's happening to Harry, it's like, ah, you know, it's his first time. Like maybe he's just struggling up there but like that doesn't happen in the book so yeah you're right it does seem like the type of thing that should have stood out in a much more obvious way it does seem like that um thankfully uh hermione is sitting across the stands from the teachers and notices it and decides it is up to her to solve this problem and i mean i want to know why hermione is not running for wizard track because hermione is sitting in apparently 50 foot stall stands and sees across the pitch Snape mouthing the counter jinx or what she believes is the jinx and she runs to the ground from five stories up across the pitch and then up five flights of stairs. That, that's ten flights of stairs that's for ten those keeping of stairs. track. And I'm like, and this is like just like an eleven year old girl. Like even if she is sprinting, like apparently she doesn't go across the field either. You know, you got to think she goes around. Like yeah, she's yeah. not going to be allowed on the field. Right. Yeah. Most right? likely. Although Madame Hooch isn't paying attention. <laughs> that's to true. Things, she's so. just like Flint is scoring. And <laughs> as I think about it, though, the fact that it only scores five kind of embarrassing. You should be way more than that. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, that's a good point. she apparently makes it all the way over, make down, over, back. Back up, light Snape's robes on fire, and then it takes an additional thirty seconds for him to notice. The thirty seconds. Thirty is, seconds. Yeah. I feel like if we were to give you a thirty-second moment of silence, you, you would be like blown away. Thirty seconds is too long. It is way too long. Yeah. Now, to be fair, that it should have stopped the moment that she knocks Quirrell over, which That's happens true. well. 30 seconds well before, which means there's like 30 seconds of Snape just continuously undoing the jinx before he notices it. And apparently he finishes doing it and then just happens to be at the same time that he notices that he's on fire. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably a fair point. Yeah. So maybe, maybe this is the type of thing where like whatever Quirrell is doing, like you almost imagine um, like that they're that they're both casting 
like jinx and counter jinx simultaneously and like one sort of like it's kind of like a like a different sort of duel yeah if you will but maybe it's the type of thing where like snape continued to keep his eyes fixed on the ear and was continuing to like basically like un- unwind whatever quarrel had already done. right um but again as you learn more about snape it does seem like the type of thing that snape just would have been able to like absolutely like dismantle because one of the things that, that i will always credit snape for is i do think he's a super powerful wizard except the healing um, his leg except the healing his leg yeah but again we we covered that, you know. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's fluffy. It's fluffy. It's it's, it's that fluffy venom. It's three dog saliva. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. That's that. It just you know, it really gets <clears throat> into your bloodstream. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, let's see here. So then, look, what do we have next? Then Harry swallows the snitch. Yeah. Okay. This was this was the thing that I think stood out to me the most about this entire chapter. Actually, was just simply how quickly following um, Hermione inter- Hermione's interference that. Harry just like it, like in my mind, I, I feel like I have repainted the picture that like Harry still patrols and patrols and like you know him and the Slytherin Seeker like duking it out trying to figure out yeah. who can like get to this like the the snitch the fastest. But it's basically just like his broom is being jinxed, uh, and then the moment that it's over, he goes into a dive and swallows the snitch. Yeah, just like on accident. Like yeah, yeah. The this is one where maybe the movie did it a little bit better, where they pull out of the dive and Harry is broom surfing like a boss, like a boss, and then uh, like leans a little too far forward and accidentally swallows it, even though he was about to grab it. This just sounds like he saw it was like, hey, there it is. <laughs> 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 got it. I got. I w- did we win? Excellent. Did re- we win? <laughs> Excellent re- reenactment. Um, although that being said, Flint is saying he didn't catch it. He nearly swallowed it as like a like a counter. Um, it, it's like Flint. You can't possibly think it makes a difference. Yeah, he's holding like, it in his hand now. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this this would be like if if like a wide receiver in football managed to somehow like. I, I, in fact, I think this has even been like a thing before, where like a quarterback threw the ball and it got stuck in somebody's like face mask. Yeah. You know, it's like. If it didn't hit the ground, I mean, you know, still like in it's, play, it's still in play, yeah, still in play. Yeah, you know, I mean, but he got it in his hands eventually. Yeah, um, and then of course the other, the kind of big thing about the fact that Harry catches it with his mouth ends up being uh, super vital to um, the discovery of how to get the hidden message from the snitch uh, from Dumbledore. You know what's great about this is that Dumbledore uses this snitch as a way to make sure that the ministry is unable to open the snitch and recover the stone inside right even if they go and do harry in person and let him physically touch it but you know what dumbledore wasn't even at this match to watch it happen (laughs) he just somebody told him. someone told him he's like i have an idea i have an idea i know what's gonna work i'll put it in my will i'll put it in my i'm gonna put it in my diary for a rainy day it'll be great it'll be great it's good uh, this is going to work out so well because they're going because they'll forget they'll forget the way it played out and then when mm-hmm. they remember it's going to be like oh that's right mm-hmm. and then all the readers will be like oh my gosh I remember that moment yeah anyway so then they they leave uh, the Quidditch pitch where Harry is a hero for the first time doing a great job so proud of him they go to Hagrid's hut where they have a strong uh, cup of tea and basically you start to kind of get like this first um, first major glimpse at how much the staff seems to back Dumbledore's belief that Snape is in fact trustworthy. Yeah. Because we also eventually know that like even McGonagall, I think in, in Deathly Hallows says like, like, you know, he, he, um, like Dumbledore always trusted Snape. He said that there was an ironclad reason to do so. Like, which sort of suggests that like the teachers are always like, yeah, we, we get where you're coming from, but we can't say that out loud. Right. You know, yeah. like, 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 yeah, we get why you suspect Snape of everything. We do too, but like, we trust Dumbledore and Dumbledore trusts Snape. And if so facto, that's, that's just getting have to roll with it. Right, right. So, you know, for, for years and years and years, Harry will have this issue with both um, Snape and Malfoy where he's just always suspecting them and nobody ever, ever, ever seems to believe him. Uh, which and for is, the most part, he's wrong until he's right. Until he's right. Um, we also, get like a bit more of the the big information uh dumps that are going to kind of get us closer towards harry ron and hermione starting to like put the pieces of the the bigger picture puzzle together uh which is learning about fluffy the three-headed dog which of course um hagrid has one off of a greek chappy he met in the pub or bought him bought off him of. yeah bought that's him off right chappy um this is kind of interesting uh again going back to the film just a little bit because i think in the movie he says it's an irish chap uh, which oh, is really? kind of like, like 
<coughs> specifically a Cerberus. Is that the right? Cerberus. Cerberus, yeah. yeah. It's like a Greek mythological like beast. Yeah, I mean, Cerberus is like the... the it, it's not like a... I don't know if it's like a breed of dog. I think it's a specific dog that guards like the gates to the underworld for Hades. Okay. Yeah. But but anyway, I mean, the fact that it's Greek in particular is like a notable like attribute of this. Yeah, it's part of Greek mythology. Yeah, but yeah. so the fact that like they changed it to Irish in the film is almost like did you guys miss the reference like it was green right. for a reason yeah that like, was yeah no that was yeah to change it anyway yeah oh this is also that's one of those things where sometimes people ask what happens to fluffy after this story because it does seem like fluffy just sort of disappears for no reason yeah um and fluffy is sent back to greece yes yeah. okay that's the explanation that so is the explanation that's where fluffy ends up going yeah. um Anyway, so then there's the the like trying to steal what uh, Hagrid clearly knows more than um, you know probably is strictly speaking safe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're Dumbledore uh, and he lets leak the bit of information that what they're guarding is between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Mm-hmm. This is one of those where I like I wish I could read the books for the first time again to see if I would notice that Nicholas Flamel had already been mentioned. I know. Like back on the chocolate frog card. Because like, but I even even if you remembered it and flipped back and were like, oh, Nicholas Flamel, look, he's right here. They already talked about it. It just says like alchemy. So you sort of also have to know enough about alchemy to do it. Also, if you're really savvy, it's the title of the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe you could have pieced it together from that. Yeah, um, yeah. I, that, that's a good point. Like at this point in time, as you're reading the book, you are now like, I would say, let's see, maybe like 70% of the way through the story and nobody has really mentioned whatever this philosopher's or sorcerer's stone. Yeah is supposed to be right. So it does feel like, you know, any anybody worth their salt should be like, I bet that's what it is. I bet that's what I bet. It's the philosopher stone. Yeah. 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 I guess. Uh, yeah, that that's a uh, it doesn't it, it feels like maybe isn't the title a little spoilery for figuring out what it is. And it's like, nope, turns out it's not <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they just yep. don't mention it. I love how Hagrid reasons like his reasons for why it can't be Snape. He says Snape's a Hogwarts teacher. He do nothing of the sort. And it's like what is interesting is that he is is actually correct about Snape, but his reasoning is very incorrect because it is Quirrell and he is a Hogwarts professor and he would do something of the sort. Right. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like one of those where, but again, I mean, I think this is where Hagrid placed so much trust in Dumbledore where like, you know, Hagrid would just be like, there's no way in the world Dumbledore would ever hire somebody who would do something <coughs> this wrong. Right. Like, and I think that that's just like Hagrid's standing belief. And again, as we go forward, what we'll know is that like Dumbledore does know that Quirrell is not uh, is up to no good. Yeah, and this is this is like where you can start really touching the edges of the the concept of Dumbledore's big plan properly, which is that mm-hmm. like the the first year of Harry's schooling in particular, it largely feels like. D- Dumbledore knows the prophecy. He pretty much knows what Harry's up against. He's always believed that Voldemort will eventually come back and that Harry's entry into the wizarding world is essentially going to be the catalyst that will ultimately um, probably spark the return of Voldemort. So it pretty much seems like Dumbledore as a betting man, as somebody who like, you know, makes particularly good guesses. Yeah pretty much knows what's going on. Yeah. Um, and in like I think even in, in our version of Dumbledore's big play, and we possibly included the belief that like maybe even the reason that like Hagrid in particular knows such specific details or collects the Philosopher's Stone while he's with Harry, you know, while Harry's like going yeah. to collect his school supplies. Like it all comes back to the to the eventual line or belief on Harry's behalf that like Dumbledore basically thought Harry deserved to have a go at it if he so desired. Right. It's like he wanted him to piece it together. It's like I can't imagine Dumbledore knew enough to know that Voldemort was living on Quirrell's head because like if Dumbledore knew exactly where Voldemort was, it feels like he just tries to take him out. It, it does. Know? It seems that way. I mean, that's a good point. But like, I think that there's there's something to the tune of like the neither can live while the other survives. Like you know, like it, it, like one of them has to defeat the other effectively. Right. So I mean, it could be the type of thing where like you know, Dumbledore's like pretty much when it comes down to it, like it has to be Harry. You know, like right. all, all like what I have to do, what I have to do is prepare Harry. It can't be anybody else. Like I can't I I can try to interfere, but the prophecy dictates that I won't I won't I won't him. succeed. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, if Dumbledore's smart enough to put enough faith in the prophecy in this particular way, it's like 
it's it's up to him. It has to be Harry. He does tell Harry. I think it might be this book. It might be the next one that there's like, if we can delay him coming back over and over and over and over, maybe he'll never come back or something. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That that might be the diary, though. I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember for sure or not. But the diary is also the thing that finally tips Dumbledore off to the fact that what Voldemort is using is Horcruxes. Yes. So yeah. That, that's probably a piece where like Dumbledore didn't know how uh, up until this moment Voldemort was achieving immortality. Right. How and why he wasn't destroyed in the first place. So right. That is a big tipping point in the overall saga in terms yes. of what Dumbledore knows and in, in the information. So. Anyway, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a fun chapter. It's definitely got like some clunky bits to it, but I do appreciate it's kind of like um, I, I think about like the movie Encanto and how every one of the songs that comes about like helps progress the plot so nicely. This feels like a really good situation where like Harry experiencing the wizarding world in this form of playing Quidditch is also like the plot moves forward at the same time. So yeah. It's not just like a throwaway chapter where it's like, yeah, Harry plays a sport this chapter. Right. It's like it does a good job of establishing like more world building and like this is the pacing in the first book is very fun. Like every chapter has something fun happening. It's like because there's so much to discover. It's like, oh, Harry's dropped off at the Dursleys. Harry releases a snake. Harry is a wizard. Diagon Alley. Green Gots. You know, now we're on the Hogwarts Express. Now we're at Hogwarts. Now, hat, yeah, yeah. Now there's the sorting hat. Now there's a troll. You know, it's like there's, there's like now there's a Quidditch match. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, chapter after chapter, there's definitely just like always something going on, which which I think is probably what made people, you know, upon reading just this first book alone, just fall so in love with the series because yeah. it was just sort of like, well, I want more of that. Right. Exactly. But that pretty much brings us to the end of chapter eleven, Quidditch. Uh, next up, we'll have the Mirror of Eris said a very oh. important chapter indeed. Um, but Ben, what did you think of the uh, the chapter art here for chapter eleven? We have basically just a couple of um, Quidditch players swooping around and some balls flying through the air. I guess all four balls. Yeah. Do we have all four? Let's see. I see yeah. a bludger. What looks like I mean, a there puffle, are four balls. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. There we go. Yeah. I think. I think they're all there. Um, no, I love it though. I mean, just just Quidditch in general. I, it, it's kind of one of those things like Quidditch. I sometimes I feel bad like beating up on it a little bit because it does seem like some of the some of the rules, some of the details of it are just so like silly and quirky and weird. But like yeah. at the same rate, it is like one of my favorite parts of like all, oh. all of the Wizarding World. Yeah. Like, when when we were writing the like, what if Harry was in Slytherin? In the script and whenever we got to a Quidditch match, it was super fun just to write the Quidditch matches. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's just sort of like what what all goes what all goes different now. How does it play out? Like, yeah, and like yeah. how will that matter? How can you how can you use the match to help develop the characters? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So that's very fun. Also, I'm kind of looking at the artwork on the Quaffle here, and I'm like trying to decide if it's sort of got that weird indented like um, shape to it that it does in the movies in this picture. I think it might. Yeah, this sort of like is this because this would sort of be like the very first interpretation of a quaffle and it does sort of look like it has that like misshapen quality to it. So maybe it's like is this the source of why the quaffle looks like the quaffle? You know what I've always found interesting about the quaffle in particular is that it's just so inherently non magical. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's just a regular ball. Well, or a misshapen ball, I a guess. Mis a regular misshapen ball. Yeah. Um, the other big question I have, too, is that, like, you know, in this chapter, a couple people take, like, a bludger to the head. It, it makes you wonder a little bit whether or not, like, th there's anything... Uh, like, I was reading just a little bit behind the scenes that, like, the beater's bats, in particular, actually carry their own enchantments um, that, like, kind of, like, help them maintain durability whilst otherwise smacking cannonballs right you know through the air um i i do wonder i mean like if you were to take a cannonball to the head or, or a bludger to the head like i mean it seems like that would basically take you out yeah like it i mean it seems like it could kill you it does um, seem like that it feels like for for what is effectively high school they should have some sort of like cushioning charm on the blood you're like yeah it'll knock you around but like it's, this isn't the pros but i mean that's, that's like my curiosity is basically like you know it's like i, I almost wonder at all like with bludgers if like they are meant to be disruptors and like while it's very easy to imagine how they could be incredibly dangerous like i almost wonder if like they they more like like can speed along and like once they like come in contact with you it's more like shoving you yeah than, than like just hitting you via cannonball velocity, right you know, like of some kind right um which i mean is never explicitly stated and you know it seems like we have plenty of instances where a cannon or where a bludger does hit somebody and and 
causes rather significant damage. Um, but like that, that's like one of those things where it's like, I can't tell if there's like a chance that like wizards are just like more durable. I think I, it's, I don't feel like they're more durable as they are just like more repairable. <laughs> you Maybe know? that's it's it. Like, yeah. yeah. You break your arm. It doesn't matter because I just wave my wand in your back. Like, yeah, it hurt, but like pff, you're good. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that, that sort of like tracks a little bit. We were talking a little bit about like wizard money and how like it seems like maybe coveting gold is is like um, not as common within the wizarding world because you can solve a lot of your issues with magic right anyway yeah so it seems like you know just just hearkening in on your like your your skill uh as a wizard is probably just as useful as having like a like a a vast stores of wealth right you know so it's like maybe it's the same thing where it's just sort of like it's like yeah you know like injuries we don't really mind that injuries can happen because we can just fix them right not that big of like if you yeah these aren't like cursed injuries these are like mogul injuries you're enduring right right right, yeah yeah so you broke your arm it's like no big deal right we, 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 just a just a flick of the wand. We'll flick be of the wand. Anyway, do you have a review for us to clo- close out today's episode? I sure do, Ben. This is from Theory List. It says, "Okay, so first of all, I love everything you do. Y'all are awesome. You help me calm down and laugh all the time." Anyway, so my theory is that Harry is a seer. In Chapter Seven of Philosopher's Stone, he has the dream about the turban talking to him, and along with all of his other dreams of things happening, like when Nagini attacks Mister Weasley or when Frank the Gardener gets killed. I think it's possible. Anyway, love your shows. What do you think? is Harry a seer? Oh, man. I mean, I, I there's no doubt about it that Harry's dreams are extremely telling. Um, but the big thing that I think you have to uh, like like keep in mind, at least, is just simply the fact that um, Harry has like a, a connection to Voldemort's yeah. mind. And I feel like when Voldemort is rising in power, like I, I feel like almost what you're seeing with like the turban dream is like that's a very mist like form version of Voldemort. So like maybe it is a bit more abstract in terms of like how Harry entering into Voldemort's mind looks mm-hmm. you know because because there's less of a mind to enter it's yeah. more it's more like a blurred concept of like like thoughts and elements um whereas like when he's like witnessing like what's happening to um frank bryce is that the gardener yeah. um like literally at this point in time you've got like rudimentary Voldemort who has this like basic body back he's still incredibly weak but like entering into his mind you know you might be able to see what's going on and then as you continue forward and like you know uh like Voldemort discovers that Harry's destroying his horcruxes you know at that stage of the process Harry's not just like seeing what Voldemort is seeing but he's feeling what Voldemort is feeling yeah I mean yeah Harry eventually gets to the point where he can just like flit into Voldemort's mind like at will yeah yeah yeah. but there and so you're I mean Harry certainly has uh, most of the things he's seeing are in real time not like the future Yes, that's yeah. a good point as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. So he's he's witnessing like what Voldemort is experiencing somewhere. Right. So I don't think Harry is a seer because we also never see him um, see anything in the future that is not related to Voldemort. Right. And most of the things to do with Voldemort are in the present and they are all basically directly connected to the fact that Harry is a Horcrux and he's typically either seeing he's seeing through the vantage point of another Horcrux whether that's Voldemort or another piece of Voldemort's soul whether that's Voldemort prime himself or like through Nagini's eyes when she attacks like Mr. Arthur Weasley. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Um and what else I was going to say about this was that basically like Trelawney we do know eventually is like I mean despite the fact that she is teaching the class that should suggest that she should know that she she's a seer it seems like the actual visions she does experience like the the two that like Dumbledore yeah. regards as like wow I think that what you witnessed was like an actual true blue prophecy um she's not aware of uh, yeah she of doesn't them. even know that they happened yeah which is which is sort of like its own kind of like interesting so like the fact that uh, like I, to me what that suggests is that like as a seer if it's a skill like it probably must be the case that you almost need to become um, what's the term some people have talked about this before like inside of their dreams where they can become like in the driver's seat and they can like fly around and lucid dreaming yeah uh, is the term for it mm-hmm. and like it's people say you can train yourself to have lucid dreams where you can basically like fall asleep and then in the magical world of sleep just do whatever you do want whatever to you do. want um, so it almost makes me feel like see to be a seer is like in a similar capacity. Like, yeah, you almost have to realize you're having these, these visions and then also be able to like consciously enter the vision so that you can 
take something from it. Yeah. Uh, but weirdly, the other thing about Trelawney is that like while she is unaware of the genuine prophecy she has, all of the little predictions she makes along the way are all actually true. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah it's, which it's, is annoying because she's like such a fraud, but like she's still always right. I know. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun when we get to we get to prisoner of Azkaban <laughs> and we can take all of like her little like one aside comments and be like, this actually this happens, does yeah. happen. Yeah, <laughs> like she's she's not like she she is making it up, but somehow also it does come to pass. Right. Yeah. Or some of the times, some of the times she's not like when she's like, yeah, Neville's going to break the cups. And it's like, sure enough, Neville broke the cups. And it's like, did you just recognize that Neville's really clumsy or did you just genuinely prophesize that? <laughs> right. That's the question. Yeah. 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 No, it's very interesting. So uh, anyway, I'll be, I'll, I'm looking forward to uh, for, for book three when we can really like just completely peel apart every layer of what Trelawney yeah. has to say. Well, man, we're getting close to the end of book one here because that was chapter 11, right? Yes. Yeah, so we're coming up on chapter 12. Chapter Premier 12 of, of 17. One of my favorite chapters. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm super excited about this one. This it's is a super be, sad one. <laughs> it is a super sad one. Very, it's going to hit you just square in the feels. Mm-hmm. But the Mirror of Arisad is always one of those that I've just always thought was just like a, like truly amazing. And I remember remember as a kid uh the the discovery that era said is desire backwards just thinking like oh, oh. It's like, there, there's like just, if you saw it in a mirror then it's you could read it yeah, oh yeah. it's so cool <laughs> anyway i love the mirror of era said as an artifact it's a fun one so looking forward to chapter 12 but otherwise until next time we will see you through the griffin door Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Bonathan Carlin. And I'm Jen Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, Door, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised. Oh, man. From the very beginning of this whole show, this is like the chapter that I was like, I, I was so excited. for. You're so excited for this one. I was very excited for it. And I actually I did really bad math the first time uh, that I was reading uh, that I was trying to like figure out when chapter 12 would land based on like we started on like October 1st. And I think originally I was like, oh, my gosh, the Mirror of Error said chapter 12 is going to land like on the episode that would come out around Christmas. Man. And I, I failed to realize that we released the first three episodes on day one and yeah. it was not accounting for that and yeah. therefore we are only nine weeks from the original start date yeah uh and so and not 12 yeah so we're but even we're, three weeks from now isn't christmas it's close well it is close, as of yeah. recording as of recording yeah, <laughs> yeah. but on release that's date, true it's you're right you're yeah. right because you're that's what i'm thinking of i'm like it's not you not only messed up some math <laughs> <laughs> We're not even close. Listen, man, yeah. I went to wizard school and they don't teach math. They don't there, teach so. math. Anyway, they, um, don't, they don't have seven sided coins either. Jay, tell me how you feel about the mirror of Era said as a mirror. chapter. What, what do we have inside of this chapter? All right. So basically, as uh, just a basic plot summary of it, it is Christmas at Hogwarts and Harry and basically just the Weasley brothers are left at the Gryffindor common room where together they eat about a hundred turkeys for dinner. <laughs> I wrote the, uh, I wrote <laughs> the same thing down at the <laughs> feast. I'm like, why is it why so, is big? Like, so big? This is way too much food. <laughs> way too much food. Um, and then uh, Harry gets the cloak of invisibility, which he takes out um, into the castle on Christmas night and discovers the mirror of Erised where he sees his parents for the very first time. And then he brings Ron to see it. And then on the third night, Dumbledore reveals himself. And it's like, I've been watching you the whole time, Harry. <laughs> Just like that. That's how you interpret Dumbledore. Just like that. It was it, it would, it would back sh- again, Harry. It would change. It would change the way in which I interpret the character rather <laughs> drastically. I feel like it's amazing how much the delivery. You know, it's like yeah, back mm. again, Harry. Yeah. Versus like. Back again, Harry. I know, yeah. It's sort of like if he's just sort of like some kooky old old wizard. You you love kooky Dumbledore, though. I do general. love kooky Dumbledore. Yeah. It's mostly it's all sourced from the uh, Potter Puppet Pals back in the day, which was like, uh, I mean, if you don't know what Potter Puppet Pals is, I have great news for you. If you're 12 episodes into this Harry Potter podcast and haven't heard of it, whoo, 
It is a trip down memory lane. It is a hilarious series. But anyway, uh, the Dumbledore in that, they, he just looks like a little hand puppet, but he just talks. He's just sort of like a total goofball. <laughs> he is a total goofball. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's very kooky. Um, so I would recommend go and check that out. But whenever I do um, Dumbledore voice, I always think that's a really funny one. If you've ever seen, um, uh, what is it, a Harry Potter musical, it feels like that's the Dumbledore they also kind of sourced for their Dumbledore in that play. Interesting, interesting, <laughs> yeah. interesting. He's yeah. just sort of very, just, yeah, very goofy and like, yeah, I'm the smartest one, but I'm not really paying attention to anything. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, and there's no doubt. I mean, he's a fun-loving, whimsical guy, so there's there's that to be said yeah. for him. But anyway, let's let's go ahead and comb through the chapter because I did yes. have I did have lots of notes, but I also had some like swaths of time where I didn't have any notes, which kind of surprised me because this was like the chapter that I really thought things were going to go uh, whiz bang pow which to be fair they do and if you subscribe to Dumbledore's big plan which I absolutely do there's lots of evidence this, inside of this chapter th- this for is it. one of those chapters that is absolutely like like a huge this is like the the huge Dumbledore's big plan is officially like this is where you can point many arrows to yes. to be like no Dumbledore is absolutely setting things up for Harry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it feels like there can be just literally no mistake. So yeah. um, anyway, let's let's go ahead and kick things off uh, as we dive into the very first paragraph. There's always like one of these fun little little bits that I'm, I I feel without knowing, I know you also highlighted. Which I is, absolutely did. It is the Weasley twins, <laughs> twins were punished for bewitching several snowballs, so they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. Oh, my gosh. It's just like like the fur on your first pass of the book, you'd be like, <laughs> "Oh, Quirrell, he can't even defend himself from the students." <laughs> right, yeah, and, <laughs> but yeah, like Fred and George, yeah, oh man, <laughs> that's hilarious. But then when you read it, it's like the Weasley twins were like having snowballs hit Voldemort in the face, which is just epic. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, yes, they yes, don't yes. even know. It's just like it <laughs> doesn't say who punished them, but I always, I never take it as Quirrell punished the Weasley twins. Right, you know, right. He's yeah. just sort of letting it happen. Like I imagine Voldemort's like Quirrell. What right. are you doing? He has the yeah, like he has to maintain like his sort of like pushoveredness. Yeah, uh, you know, re, like the the fainting at trolls kind of behavior. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, he's he's definitely yeah. So it, I, it, it wasn't Quirrell. It wasn't Quirrel. Almost certainly Snape. Yeah. I feel, almost Gondor. certainly Snape. Yeah. yeah. Could absolutely be it. Um. So yeah, I love that. Just little inclusion, little uh, little nod to hitting Voldemort in the face. There. It it talks about how cold the castle is. Like a bitter wind rattled the windows. A windows. You know, the corridors had become icy is what it says. The drafty corridors had become icy. I'm always like, why is this the case? Like, can't you shouldn't it like magically be warm in the castle? You <laughs> like, know, that's a good point. I like literally I was about to say, I was about to point out the fact that I was like, Jay, it's a castle. You know, it's yeah. a stone structure. It's a magic it, castle, it, Ben. It, yeah, it's a but it is in shouldn't fact a magic castle. Shouldn't have these problems. Th- this is one of those things where I tend to imagine the corridors to absolutely be inside of the castle and on some level they just simply are. I, w- I wouldn't I wouldn't like believe any other explanation. But like in inside of like Philosopher's Stone, we see lots of like courtyard related scenes where the corridor may literally bring you physically outside side um similar to like the breezeway we had you know yeah. in our middle school that's you, true you yeah, like it could walk actually outside, be to go outside. To lunch. yeah that's true it could be the case like that i also think especially if a lot of times i think a lot of times at hogwarts there is like this unwritten rule that dumbledore like doesn't like like the fact that the the uh corridors are like icy and windy and stuff. It's like, it feels like a very magically fixable problem. And I feel like there's a lot of things that Dumbledore is like, I like things to be a, like a little more muggly than they need to be for the sake of the students having to overcome stuff. Yeah, this is boot camp. This is, I mean, <laughs> I, because not only is there stuff like this, but then later in the chapter, we're going to meet um, Madam Pince, the... Oh, the librarian, the librarian who has no interest in helping. Who has no interest in like helping the students find. But it's just like, there's too many teachers at a school who like just seem like they actively hate children. Yes. You know, it's like, right. wh- why? Why would you have Filch working here? Why would you have a librarian who hates kids work at a school? Why would you have Snape who hates kids working at a school? I mean, Snape, you know the reason. S- but. Snape's a completely different story. Yeah. yeah. But like, no, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, even Hagrid... Uh, I think like sort of remarks like, "Wow, you guys are going to the library the day before break." Like, kind of like he, he's kind of like, "Why?" Yeah. Um, and you know, so it's like, but if you're the librarian, you have to appreciate the kids who are the probably the only kids who are in the library attempting to like uncover information about something. So the only thing I would say is is they are specifically attempting to unearth what is otherwise a kind of like very obvious Hogwarts centric secret that's happening at the moment. So maybe maybe they are just like 
going and poking around and like pulling books that don't seem to like make any sense. Because if you're the librarian, you know that these students are pulling books that are not related to their coursework. Right. And and so on some level, maybe Madame Pince is over there like, what are they? Like, I know. I know they have no business being over there. It, well, uh, yes. But at the same time, all the books they're pulling are just like history, like modern history books, basically. Yeah. You know, it's not like necessarily nefarious. It's not like unusual potions of the 20th century or anything. I do find it to be kind of interesting that that it's like a little wink a little bit that all the books in particular that they're pulling all happen to be like witches and wizards of the modern age. Oh, and, yeah. You know, yeah. it's like because he's Nicholas Flamel is like 600 some year, uh, right. years. Right. So, so the problem is that like he, he's too old to be showing up in. Yeah. They all have like a modifier that makes them recent. It says great wizards of the 20th century century uh, notable magical names of our time and then uh important modern magical discoveries recent developments in wizardry it's like yeah what what is the what is the thing like because there's another modifier that we'll eventually learn about uh with the history of magic by bathilda bagshot where it's like yeah. she didn't cover anything after the 19th century you know it's like a, it's oh. like a simple like she's a historian right. not a like in the, up until very recently at least probably even as of the chapter we're reading right now is still alive yeah um and so like she's she's doing a history of magic not a modern retelling of what just happened right yeah, that's the news yeah, <laughs> yeah she'll, she'll, she'll wait like 200 years for somebody else to be a historian to tell the the secrets of of today um anyway so as we as we we, we jumped ahead a little bit so let's let's move slower um yes. there, there is a scene that actually is like a little bit like joyous here which is that um malfoy is attempting to uh use his influence to spread sort of like negative feelings towards Harry, you know, basically making jokes about how uh, the Gryffindor Quidditch team might replace him with a wide mouth tree frog because Harry caught the snitch with his mouth. Um, but I, I love the fact that it's like then he'd realized that nobody found this funny because they were also impressed the way Harry managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. And it's just like we don't get many situations like this where Malfoy is actually like sort of like put back in his place. Yeah, like, right. It seems like most of the time Malfoy's propaganda against Harry just works. It does. It doesn't normally seem like that like it, this isn't even like even the Slytherins it's like what do you what are you making fun of him it's like he, he's like he hasn't really gotten good at like bullying Harry just yet or right, something like he's still honing his <laughs> he's skills. Like, I'm still honing my skills right. it's like I'm gonna make fun of Potter for catching the snitch wait wait they, he did he did beat us. but he did beat Slytherin mm. by catching the snitch yeah right so mm. okay new new tack new tack yeah his new tack is so Malfoy jealous and angry had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family feels which, like it, I, too far in the other direction. Overcorrection, too, it Malfoy. Is, it is an overcorrection. Yeah. This is like one of those where I'm like, Malfoy should have like lost some serious street cred in the process because that is like, I I don't care who you are and I don't care how mean other kids are at high school. I don't feel like people go this far. This is too far. This it is, is way too far. It's blatantly mean. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I did. I, I, wrote, I, I could see the end of that sentence and I wrote the note mean and I was like, yeah, but Malfoy's always mean. But I'm like, no, you know what? That's still, that's just mean. It like, is. That's, that's, you know, even for him. Him. Right, um, but uh, I love that. Even it's still, it's also as as way overcorrected it is. It's still ineffective against Harry because it says he didn't feel sorry for himself at all. <laughs> yeah, he'd be go. staying at Hogwarts um, uh, for uh, Christmas. I also like. Um, that it's uh, we so Harry we know obviously is at Hogwarts and then it says uh, Ron and his brothers were staying too because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. This to me feels super duper on purpose that like because this is Ron like if you're Molly and Arthur you've just sent your youngest son to his first year at Hogwarts right like they have not seen Ron their 11 year old son since September and they're like nah just stay. <laughs> Right, we'll go and visit our adult yeah, son. Our instead. adult son, right? Yeah, we're gonna go do that. Like, this is one thousand percent Molly and Arthur being like, "Boys, you need to stay with Harry." Yeah, and I <laughs> had know. two different thoughts about this. One yeah. of them was that, like, thank goodness for Harry that somebody stayed back so that like he had friends for like his first Christmas away yes, from the Dursleys. Absolutely, like, that that is like that's so joyous. But the other one is that Hermione actually goes home. I know, um, which is like <clears throat> one of those things where I often feel like as sweet and kind 
kind and caring as Hermione Granger is, there's there can be no doubt that like from the time she like leaves for Hogwarts, her poor parents basically don't see her again. Yeah, no, I mean this they get to see her this Christmas, but after this, it's like sorry, mom and dad, I don't really like skiing. I'd rather do homework. I, yeah, my friends need <coughs> me. Yeah, like uh, that's like one of those things, right? I mean, I, like, and it's great. Like, I'm glad that Hermione puts her friends, you know, like like holds them in such high regard and everything. But it is it is almost comical how at all times it's like you really always sort of need to bend the rules enough so that Harry, Ron, and Hermione can be doing things together over the holidays. <coughs> but when you zoom back, it's like. Like a, as a as a now parent, the the thought of like Addie even going to like like giving me all the way up until she's eighteen and potentially leaving for college or whatever. Yeah, but if she left for college and didn't come home. Yeah, until she was like like through through, through her senior year, I would be like devastated. Yeah, I'd be like, wow, good to see you. Yeah, no, but, but, yeah. Uh, no, but at that point in time, if I hadn't seen her for four years, I'd be like, it is so good to see you. I missed yeah. you so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming back. Thanks for coming back. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, but but you're absolutely right again to back to Dumbledore's boot camp. They're in, they're in uh, the dungeons of, for potions where they can literally like see their breath, yeah. you know, in front of their face. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, they stumble across Hagrid carrying in the 12 Christmas trees for the holiday feast so ki- kind of the the folks at hogwarts to give each student who stayed behind i know their, their own, own tree. christmas tree also good to know the boot camp extends to the staff as well because it always it always is hilarious to me that hagrid has to drag in 12 christmas trees which are enormous by the way oh yeah and yeah. it's just like like why should hagrid have to do this when magic exists <laughs> right, right, like right. you're <laughs> manually making this man carry trees <laughs> Like, even for Hagrid, have you ever tried to lift a tree? Because trees are heavy. Trees, tree, tree, mighty dense, mighty Try, dense. Tree, but you know what's not heavy? For any, you know what? Magic, magic's not heavy. All anyone has to do is be like, Wingardium Leviosa. And it's in. Cool. Thanks, yeah. Hagrid. Thanks, Hagrid. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, the fact is, especially because Hagrid has his wand. He has to, like put on this charade. A charade. Of, of dragging the trees in. Hagrid, what are you doing, man? <laughs> He's like, Professor Dumbledore, could I please? No, Hagrid. <laughs> we must keep up appearances. There's your quirky Dumbledore. Again. There he is. Yeah, there quirky he is. Quirky Dumbledore who runs boot camp. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hagrid, are you finished manually dragging the trees in yet? Oh, my gosh. But so, yeah, okay, so they, they run into Hagrid, who they're chatting with, and then once again, Malfoy uh, pops up and starts just like slinging mud again because mm-hmm. apparently he hasn't had enough of it today. And right as Ron is diving at Malfoy, Snape comes up the stairs. And I just wrote down Harry and Ron have the worst timing and will continue to have the worst timing because a teacher will, will find them on the wrong side of every single attack for the rest of their schooling. Like, life. not that it even matters. I mean, Hagrid is there to watch the entire exchange and he's just like whoa Snape just so you know that was totally warranted and Snape's like shut up Hagrid yeah but he, and he still takes five points from I them know. it's like it's like okay Snape you know what another another Hogwarts <laughs> staff member literally just vouched for for these people it's like I think you, you need to let it go and he's like nah five points anyway yeah. this, this is one of those things where people always make the joke at how at the end of the year Dumbledore goes through and he's just like 50 points to Harry 50 points to Hermione oh it's actually 60 to 60 Harry. to Harry yeah, yeah he's I, more important I caught myself i caught myself but like everybody is always sort of like well how much does does gryffindor need to beat slytherin okay I'll, i can figure this out I'll, yeah. I'll math 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 yep no problem mm-hmm. um but to be fair like i almost feel like what dumbledore is actually doing is like yeah snape snape took off like a just a like a buttload of points yeah. throughout the year he's so like looking like, at the ledger he's like mm-hmm mm-hmm Mm-hmm. The, okay. Yeah, this is this is like me in fantasy football where you get to the end of the season and you see that I've made the most waiver wire moves. Yeah. It's like it's like some people it's like, oh, they made six moves, you know, like seven moves, five moves, stuff like that. And then there's Ben, it's like thirty nine moves. <laughs> it's yeah. like like I, as as like a as like a piece of data, it stands out a lot. So if he has the ledger and he's sort of like, Okay, like who who deducted the most point? Oh, it was Snape and always to Gryffindor. How about yeah. that? Yeah. How about that? There's no it's not even. It's not even. Yeah. You need to give it back. Although I mean to be fair, McGonagall takes off 150 points from Gryffindor herself. That, that is true. That is true. The, yeah. Nobody's harder on Gryffindor other than Snape and McGonagall. I know. McGonagall's really not helping the Gryffindors out in the House Cup race. That's the thing. She's just like, if we're going to earn it, we're going to earn it. We're going to earn it, people. This is and Snape's game. like, okay, I'm obviously not taking points from my house. Right. Duh. <laughs> yeah. That seems obvious. Minerva. <laughs> yeah. Rule number one. Don't, don't, don't like, yeah. 
like be your own yeah. uh, your own blockade. You almost should, like it's it almost feels like the professors shouldn't be allowed to award uh, points from to their own house. It does feel or, that or way. like right. or if you're the head of house, you shouldn't be allowed to award points to your house. That's a, yeah, okay, so that's the other thing too. Yeah, so like uh McGonagall says uh, is it McGonagall who says like Snape never let me live it down, you know, cuz Slytherin's won the house cup for the past 7 years. It's like is it possible? Is it possible that Snape is just continuously giving his house more points. Oh, I know. Like, because, <laughs> like the point totals are right there on the wall. It's just like, hmm, Slytherin's losing by 40. Oh, Malfoy, that's a that's an epic charm you just did. 41 points for Slytherin. And that'll do it. That'll, that'll do, it. do it. Look at that. The clock's run out. Oh, my goodness. We won again. Hooray. Uh, how about that? Yeah, I yeah. know. It's like, it's like McGonagall. This is an easy song. Yeah, I know. Like, you can, I mean... Yeah, that, it does seem like there needs to be some sort of checks and balances on the point system. It does feel that way. Yeah, it does feel that way. That's okay though. Um, but b- especially because it's Christmas. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah totally. Totally. So what what do we have next then? Here we have the decoration of the Great Hall, yep. which always sounds just truly amazing with Professor Flitwick's golden bubbles. Trivia blossom. question. Yeah, that is a good trivia question. Yeah. Did you highlight that? Or you I did. Just I just wrote. Yeah, I just highlighted golden bubbles and was like, that's a trivia thing right there. Uh, one of my least favorite trivia questions that we always get is sort of like, which of these was not a decoration at the you know, end of year feast or whatever. It's like, oh man, I don't. You know, they list remember the, the there's, decor. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of you know icing on this cake, so to speak. Uh, it's, it's hard to remember all the mm-hmm. all the individual things. But yeah. Either which way. Um. So then you know, there <laughs> Harry, Ron, and Hermione are telling uh Hagrid about how the, ever since you mentioned Nicholas Fumel, we've been trying to figure out who he is, and Hagrid's just like. Oh, what? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I've told you it's nothing. Um, but yeah, so then they're like, you know, then Harry's like, oh, do you just want to tell us and save us all the trouble? And Hagrid's like, no. Yeah. Oh, good times. Good times. Hilarious. Hilarious. It is almost po- it is humorous to me that he doesn't even show up in like great wizards of the 20th century because like you'd think Dumbledore would still show up in books like that. And like even on Dumbledore's chocolate frog card, like if you can choose he'll, where you get like five sentences like right. one of the sentences is he knows Nicholas Flamel and did alchemy with him so you'd right. think if there was like an entire you know chapter or page dedicated to Dumbledore it would also mention Nicholas Flamel yeah I mean even even just simply important modern magical discoveries like one way or another I think the celebration of one's uh, 600th birthday like each each century birthday would count as its own like reason to <laughs> yeah. to inscribe this accolade inside of a book so yeah um, anyway yeah that's 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 one where th- I, as ever you know it's it's it, this will this will also come up uh, see Goblet of Fire second task where they can't find Gillyweed oh, that in one's any of the, the books m- yeah this one I'll let slide because there is a fun little like oh no all the books were too recent like uh, thing in there but th- th- that they cannot find not just gillyweed, but a way to breathe underwater at all. Right, right. Is the, I mean, the other bananas. students. Yeah, it's like it's like the they the, like literally. If you're like a a seventh year at Hogwarts, you know about the bubblehead charm. Yeah, like, there is a textbook talking about the bubblehead charm. Like, I mean, Harry's a fourth year. He's not that far away from just learning oh, I know. the spell. I know, and like like. Breathing underwater is something muggles have figured out, you know? Right. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Like, like, the ability to go beneath the surface is absolutely just like, like, even kindergartners know about scuba diving. Right. So it would be like, it's like, like, five-year-old wizards should know about the bubblehead charm or whatever mechanism there is for going underwater. Right. Because it's just such a, it's such a... <laughs> A thing that needs solving that should be easily solved. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. either which way, yeah, you know, Harry gets kicked out of the library, and then it just says five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined him, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. This is like one of those where I'm like, why didn't Ron and Hermione just leave? Like at the same time as Harry. Yeah. It's like yeah, <laughs> Harry gets kicked out, and then they stayed for five more minutes. Like, it's like just just leave together. Harry's really the glue that holds the whole friendship together. Right. Hermione, yeah. Hermione and Ron are like, this is weird. <laughs> well, um, hi. You want to like m- like maybe like seven years from now have a romantic interest or something? Yeah, you want to get like <laughs> married later on or something? Yeah, yeah, we'll get there when we get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Anyway, um, so then the hol- uh, Hermione then does of course leave uh, after we learned that both of her parents are dentists, yep. which is um, you know always always great to know. Yeah. Um, it's funny that they say make sure you ask them if they know who Nicholas Fumel is because like they could know. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, that's you a know, good point. like yep. you know, Nicholas Flamel is a, is a no name here in the Muggle world. It is. It is yeah. out here it, for this reason, right? Nicholas Flamel is in fact a or, or was in fact a, a real person. Yeah, um, he did not actually discover the Philosopher's Stone, but he was a real person. Yes, that's not just a made up name. Um, but yeah, so then the holiday um, festivities have begun after Hermione takes off to go back to dentist land. <laughs> yep, I love when they're sitting there um, roasting stuff on the fire and the examples they <laughs> that are given for the. It says they. Uh, uh, they sat by that. They sat by for an hour, eating anything they could spear on a roasting fork: bread, English muffins, marshmallows. These are the three things. These are the anything things. they could find. Basically, bread, more bread, or marshmallows. Yes, yes. And I, I you know, I looked this up because I was just curious. Because I was like, I was like, you know, and what, there's a, there's like a kind of basic irony to it. But simply, English muffins is replaced in the British copy with crumpets. Oh, um, where crumpets, I think, are are for all intents and purposes similar like they are described as just like the british version of english muffins so okay. still still fairly similar but okay. it is interesting to me that english muffins is not a british thing that's true <laughs> you know well, i guess that makes sense because over there they'd just be muffins they would, that's but it. apparently they're crumpets <laughs> that's a good yeah they're crumpets and stuff yeah. so anyway but yeah i have i have often thought the exact same thing uh also like you know marshmallows are a very commonly like roasted on on fire type of thing but i never in my life have actually I, I am backtracking immediately as I was going to say. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever toasted bread over a fire. But when we were kids, mm-hmm. do you remember we had a uh, grilled cheese? I do remember it now that you're saying it. Yes, there was like you could put like a grilled cheese sandwich in this little cast iron thing and hold it over the fire and you would it would cook it, I guess. It was pretty neat. Yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Yeah, but okay, this is okay. just bread. This is this is just bread on stick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ron, Ron, get over here. Look what I can do. Toast. I'm toasting bread. (laughs) (laughs) On a fire. Uh, The novelties of the magical world. I know. I know. Uh, (laughs) Speaking of which, I love that wizard chest is just chess. Is just chess. (laughs) And I love that it's like it's like it's chess that's almost harder to play because because the chess pieces themselves sort of have like a a measure of their own sentience and they're yeah. sort of like like they can like argue with you or or sort of plead on their own behalf yeah I'm like yeah you go over there like i don't want to i'm gonna die and it's like yeah you're being sacrificed friend get over there and it's yeah. like i don't think we need to do that <laughs> right right just it almost just seems like it'd be easier to play regular chess the question I always have, though, is that like I feel like one accolade we absolutely can grant to Ron is that he seems to actually, genuinely be good at chess. Oh, I know. I felt like like this. It seems like when you read this book, like this is going to be Ron's thing. It's like if you ever watch um, Avatar: The Last Airbender, it's like you know, Aang is the Avatar, and he can basically fight anyone and always win. And Katara is like the world's greatest waterbender, and she's like super good and has like healing abilities and stuff like that. Like right. they are better in a fight than like Sokka, who is the brother who cannot bend anything. Right. But but without doubt, it is like it is proven how invaluable Sokka is because as good as the other two are fighting, they are not good at strategy. And he's always got a plan and like is like a key factor to the success. And it feels like Ron is being set up for that role. It's like, oh yeah, Ron Harry, super powerful wizard, has got all the all the power levels up. Patronus, great. Expelliarmus, great. But Ron has to like formulate where everyone's going to go and strike and stuff. And, and you know, when you look at the three of them, um, I sort of gave that like that rock paper scissors example, where it sort of seems like each one of their like inefficiencies is made up by somebody else's like abilities. Yeah. You know, th- this almost sort of me to me makes sense. Like Harry is central. He is you know sort of that like proverbial chosen one. Uh, he is uh, exemplary at defense against the dark arts. Uh, and then you've got like Hermione who is just like incredible like she's like a wealth of knowledge i mean she's like like a walking like wikipedia yeah. where she can just like pull information but like it it does almost seem like there is the obvious trajectory where then like ron can sort of be like the person who like maybe doesn't have all the information maybe doesn't have all the abilities but does like it like is able to take the essential bits and sort of like formulate or help craft sort of like the the plan yeah. the objective like where we go from here and it seems like, th- like that is exactly what this like chess accolade is supposed to be ultimately granting him. But I, but I'm wondering or curious if like as you're writing this particular character, if it doesn't 
too quickly become the case that like Ron almost feels like the mastermind. Like the issue is that if you give him too much of the ability, he almost like ends up inadvertently like casting a shadow. Right. Because so much of what they're running into is usually dealing with some measure of the unknown. So if Ron is really good at like combating the unknown and you like let that skill fly, then all of a sudden like you lose a lot of like, like even like them looking for Nicholas Fumel or Gillyweed, for example. Like, yeah. You know, this is like one of these things where it's like they can't find a solution and part of them not finding a solution is what drives the plot forward right exactly um, but it feels like ron should it feels like the sort of thing that ron should just know because he's the one with all the wizarding world knowledge exactly and kind of stuff yeah. yeah 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 like he can fill in a lot of the gaps that the other two like have their their deficiencies at yeah yeah, yeah. but that doesn't really end up being the case necessarily as we yep. move forward it's more like he's just good at chess and he, which i do like that like hermione cannot beat him at chess like ever <laughs> yes that <laughs> like is it, that is really cool it is a running character trait and it, it feels like she should be able to beat him like she should be able to think her way through it because that's the sort of thing she's good at but he's like nope i got it i always can see what you're i always see it coming yes yes yeah. yep and and so with that being said again we kind we mentioned a little bit like the whole concept of dumbledore's big plan you know at the beginning of of the episode today but this the the chess piece like and you will see more examples of it throughout this particular chapter but the chess piece is one of those where it's like if like on some level we are being granted access to the specific skills that like each of these characters and on some level embodies that ultimately become the obstacles that we see towards the end of the book. Yeah. And this is another one of those where it's like, are the obstacles specifically curated to sort of like match the abilities of Harry and company? And it feels like, you know, the, the you got like a one for one with chess. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's just a, like a, like a dead ringer. And then the other one is of course the fact that Harry has just been made seeker. And one of the challenges is catching, is, yeah, keys. catching a winged key. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we got that one and we'll, we'll get more as we continue to go. Um, one of the cool things I think is kind of fun is that like on Christmas Eve, it says Harry went to bed looking forward to the next day for the food and for the fun, but not expecting any presents at all. What's kind of neat about this is that like, especially through the lens of your typical 11 year old, um, the gifts very often are what make Christmas incredibly fun. Like, you know, as an yeah. 11 year old, you're, I mean, not that you're never like, you, you're not excited to see your family, you know, your extended family right. and stuff like that. Um, but I, I feel like the, the, at least from my own personal experiences, it felt like the big draw was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, right. Christmas morning, <laughs> gifts, like presents, you know, there's like fun, excitement. I mean, you know, there's food and candy and like that that type yeah. of stuff as well. Um, but I do love the fact that like, you know, with with no expectation of gifts at all, Harry is just like like joyous. Right, yeah. You know, this is this is fun. This is exciting. And it, 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 it uh, either which way, he ends up getting gifts. And he rather, sure does. Rather special ones. I know. He's surprised by it. Oh. Uh, Man, it's a, will you look at this? I've got some presents. It was like, oh, oh Harry. <laughs> Harry. Never got a gift before. I just want to give him a hug. I know. <laughs> what did you kid. expect? Turnips? <laughs> hey, wait a second. Turnips. No. Oh, my gosh. Okay. On a recent J versus Ben, we did the, we had the question that was, um, that was, what is the first birdie bot? bean sprouts that, that ron eats and yeah. Uh, yeah the answer is sprouts but i put turnips oh in our this recent is day why. versus ben this is what he said this oh, is when he says this it. is where it is so it's like it's like literally my brain like chose a word that was correct and ron does say it but i think we had a question about what did he say or we had like a fill in the blank quiz once upon once upon a time and this was like what did you expect blank right yeah, yeah. You're right you're right <clears throat> and, yeah. th and then that one was turnips but i think we got that one wrong too <laughs> probably so yeah it's a very obscure detail anyway it is uh <clears throat> But yeah, so uh, Harry also gets another little little nod, if you will, from Hagrid as to uh, how he will be able to eventually tackle the obstacles for the Philosopher's Stone in the form of the um, roughly cut wooden flute from Hagrid, uh, which that one again is a one-to-one -one because you literally need to play music to put <coughs> Fluffy to bed, yep. and Fluffy belongs to Hagrid, and the flute came from Hagrid. Um, yeah, so feels like maybe Dumbledore is like, hey, give him a flute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's like, Hagrid, if you're thinking of, if you're looking for something I'm just i'm just spitballing here yeah here's an you've idea you've got some time after you're done with the trees um how are you at whittling flutes right right <laughs> and can you make them sound like an owl yeah um which incidentally is the other gift that hagrid has given harry that's true hedwig. yeah yeah maybe he could have just brought hedwig <laughs> Do what? Maybe like if Harry had just brought Hedwig, could oh, Hedwig, could Hedwig have, have sung Fluffy to sleep? Oh, 
that's a good question. Ooh, that's I don't a good know. question. Yeah. I love how uh, fascinated Ron is with the uh, shape of the money, the 50 cent piece, which I, that was one of those where I was like, what a shape. This is money. I was like, does this say more about the shape of wizard gold or of English currency? Did you look up what a 50 pence piece looked like? I did, and it is seven sided. Se- okay, so that's yeah. what you mean by seven. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so it, it, it is an unusual shape. But to me, I was like, is it, am I going to look this up and it'd be like a round coin? And does that mean that wizard coins are not round? <laughs> not round. Yeah. I know. If anything, it feels like inside of this story, if there were coins of different shapes that were not round, they would have seven sides. Yeah, it does. It, feels it like, almost feels more wizardy to have a seven sided coin. Yes. What, when in doubt inside of Harry Potter trivia, the answer is seven. Right? Especially if the question has something to do with a number. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. So and then what else do we have? Um, they get the they get the sweaters. This is one of those things where like um, because they always describe uh, the Gryffindor colors as being like scarlet. Yes. Like to me, like when the scarlet's very much, I think like the English word for red, basically. It's, it's, yeah. It's like a very vibrant, <coughs> bright red. Yeah. Yeah. But so like when I was a kid, I always thought of the Gryffindor colors as basically just being maroon and gold. I agree. Like I always yeah. thought of scarlet as more maroon, which it's not. It was just like a misunderstanding. But so <laughs> Ron's complaint, I always think, remember thinking it was dumb that Ron complained that he got a maroon sweater. I'm like, but you got a Gryffindor colored sweater. Like what's the problem? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. What are you complaining about? Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's like, it, but 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 I mean, it is interesting as well because um, like the, it seems like this continues to happen with Ron and Molly, where like where it seems like for some reason like Ron just is always on the like the the. the like Molly fails to remember certain things about what's important to Ron. Right, like, like he doesn't like the corned beef sandwiches. He doesn't like the corned beef sandwiches. And doesn't like maroon. Doesn't like maroon, and then also like you know his dress robes eventually end up kind of being like a little bit like like more sad. But like you never really hear about like Fred and George's dress robes being right, sad, exactly, know? or Ginny's. Or, well, like, I guess yeah, G- like, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, you know, it's like like G- Ginny got like a dress, you know, so, yeah. it's, so you know, but like that's even one of those where, like it's like Ginny's a third year, she's not even supposed, not even supposed to be going. Yeah, right, yeah. She got asked by an upperclassman. Oh, yeah. Classic Ginny. Anyway, classic um, indeed. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, but then of course Harry also receives his own uh, emerald green sweater, which mm-hmm. sounds very cozy. Um, right. Is this the one that has the snitch on it? No. It's just no, an emerald. Th- it's just an emerald green sweater. Just an emerald green sweater. Yeah. Which, on that note, um, b- neither Harry nor Ron have anything on their sweater, but both Gred and Forge do. They sure do. <laughs> 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 I love that that joke. I remember where they. Yeah, it happens. Uh, the next page. He says, "I suppose she thinks you don't forget your name, but we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge." Yes. <laughs> like, I just remember that being the best joke I had ever heard. <laughs> when, yeah. When I, I can I can remember dad saying those words as yeah. he read this yeah. read this to us as kids it's like yep nope 100 percent. that's totally it yep um yep so that's a that's a that's a good one um and once again fred and george just really standing out as some of like my favorite characters in the story they're just always there's just always a hooting and hollering good time yeah they show up they show up so much more than you think they do i know yeah yeah, yeah. I, and I, i've always <laughs> said this and, and this is like whenever we get the question of like you know if, if they if they were to do a more long form uh which it sounds like maybe is coming anyway but longer form harry potter tv series what would you want? And and I've always sort of said that I feel like you could you could explore other characters more. Yeah. So like you could leave Harry, Ron, and Hermione and show other aspects about like what's going on. Or like maybe you've got like a Dumbledore side story and a Fred and George side side story and like the Golden Trio. Yeah. Like main story. You definitely like need that. Like yeah. would you show like Fred and George with the map in year one? I think so. Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be very interesting. It, it might be <clears throat> kind of fun if you showed it subtly because this is one of those for like first time viewers. It'd be neat if you didn't know that what they were doing was using the Marauders Oh, like, yeah, you just see them constantly, like, putting away a piece of parchment. Yes. That, like, you, you, the experienced watcher or, like, uh reader knows like oh that was the map that was the thing that yeah was the thing but like the obviously they can't like name it or like give it its moment in the spotlight until they give it to harry exactly so i think yeah. i think use <clears throat> patience if anybody's asking my advice use patience mm-hmm. let it get there organically but also like include as many like little nods uh, yes as absolutely like hint out those things yes for sure for sure um of, of course the next extremely important gift that is that is handed over during this christmas holiday is the one the only invisibility cloak the cloak of invisibility man this is one of those that like as i was reading through it this time it's like the impact it must be for harry to like get the note that says your father left this in my possession before he died it's like like for harry he has probably never even considered the idea like one we find out later in this chapter he doesn't know what they look like 
I, which, I, like dude. that. Oh my gosh. Like it's so easy to bash on the Dursleys in the first couple of chapters, but oh my God, they've never shown him a picture of his, of parents. his parents. Like I know. what? It is crazy. It so is. yeah, that is, that is bananas. Oh my God. It's, it makes me so mad. But like, so to him, I mean, he doesn't even know what they look like. So the, the idea that like he would ever own something that belonged to them probably is like extremely foreign. Like I can't imagine what it feels like reading that note and then to not know who it came from. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. And, <clears throat> and it's interesting, you know, like even, even like Harry, there's a couple of good moments I feel like inside of this chapter where, um, where Harry is almost having these, they're like, the 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 kind of correct amount of like mingled feelings where where he's like happy but overwhelmed and also kind of sad at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's like like it's the same thing after he sees, you know, he's like he doesn't want to eat like breakfast after, you know, like once he finally finds the mirror. Yeah. You know? And and I, and I feel like this is sort of um you know, like a like a like a like a similar thing. So, I give anything for one of these, he said, anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry. He felt very strange. Who would send him the cloak? Had it once really belonged to his father? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, it's just like you can you can sort of imagine like the like the the overall sort of mixed sensations that you'd be feeling here. Like, because I mean, he does not see this coming. This is a no. total surprise, but like not in a like, oh my gosh, I'm jumping up and down on the top of my bed because this is like the greatest day of my life because I just got a gift. Like, right. You know, it's like it's a very, very different kind of experience. Um, but, but then just uh, just right on cue, uh, Fred and George sort of arrive, you know, to sort of lighten the mood with their F and G sweaters, um, which is which is good stuff. I love the fact that it said Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred holding up Harry's sweater. She obviously makes more of an effort if you're not family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, this is okay. This is another thing I thought was interesting is that when the invisibility cloak is revealed, like, and it falls on the floor, Ron is able to like identify it like immediately. Oh yeah, which is point, yeah. which is sort of unusual because like uh, we know later on in the story that like other kinds of invisibility cloaks exist, like cloaks that have been imbued with like a disillusionment charm or, or that have been made out of demi guy's hair or something like that. But like so other cloaks do exist, like it's a known object to exist, but this one in particular should not like fit any description that Ron has heard before because like this is the the invisibility cloak. Yes. Right? Yes, no, I, I agree with you. And and the thing, I mean, that's it's a really good point. Um, and and so I have mixed mixed thoughts because part of me is like, well, maybe it like wasn't fully established like how unique this particular one is. Mm-hmm. But also the description um, that we get from it is Harry picked the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. And something about that description just like it does demonstrate to me that like this is a truly unique garment. Yeah, like like this is this is different this there, is yeah it absolutely is and there's like little things that aren't really mentioned about it like it's never there's things about the cloak that don't get attention drawn to them but like there's many times where like harry stuffs the cloak in his pocket or something and it's like you don't think about that because it just sounds like yeah he just folded it up and put it in there yeah what's what's the big deal and it's like just imagine though you're wearing you know your, your, your jeans or something and you take off your winter jacket and fold it up and put it into your pocket. Right. You know, it's like cloaks are massive it's pieces a lot of, of clothing. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. they don't fit in a pocket, but like there is a magical quality to the cloak that lets it be smaller than it should. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. And and one of our other favorite, uh, you know, fantasy series is, is of course, King Killer Chronicles or Name of the Wind. And uh, inside of that, you know, he does, of course, also receive what's called a shade. Yeah. Um, and it seems like the shade, it, at least in fantasy, you know, know also like abides by this sort of similar kind of magic where yeah. it's like which which makes me wonder like within fantasy if it's sort of like I, I have always read it to be implied that the that the cloak had some magically like magical ability to break down um or else is other is, is of such a remarkably fine material that when folded is just very small mm-hmm. but then like the the flip end of a fine material is usually that it's highly like uh, subject to like to tearing, yeah. you know, it's not very durable. Um, and in this case, it seems like the cloak absolutely is like, yeah, it, it can withstand like a total beating and, right. and all the rest. So yeah, there's, there's something just utterly remarkable, but I do agree. It does seem somewhat surprising that Rom would be able to recognize it. And, and maybe that's just sort of one of those, like, we got to explain it somehow. Although gotta it, explain it somehow. Although that being said, I mean, all it would take was Harry putting it on. Before absolutely. Like, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, um, our this is um so our our theory because now that you, once you know it's one of the Deathly Hallows, it's like um our theory personally about the cloak is that it is made out of like Thestral hair. Yes, right. Yeah, because yep. yeah, Thestrals are invisible on their own, and then if you know that the Peveril brothers made the wand and the Resurrection Stone, then the uh, the Elder Wand has a core of a Thestral. It does uh, hair Thestral yep. hair. Tail, tail hair, thestral tail hair. That's it. There. Yep, there we go. Be. And then um, because it's like invisible and it's a deathly hallow and thestrals have to do with death, it does seem like that could be like the source of it. Yeah. And then um, we'll talk about the mirror in a second because we like we've also theorized that the mirror is related to the resurrection stone as yes. well. Yeah. But we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, we'll get to that. I was going to say that's like <laughs> one of my one of my favorite one of my favorite. Theories Absolutely. One of my favorite ones. Yeah. Um, but as long as we're talking about garments from our family members, one of the things I do love is the uh, this, this is another line from Fred and George that just totally stood out, but it's the, come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. Like, I, just, I love the way that, like, you know, there they are receiving their, like, annual gift that is the same gift, and they're still referring to these sweaters as lovely and warm. Yeah, lovely and warm. Yeah, where is I think I, did I? No, I don't know. I don't know. I thought I had, like, highlighted that exact line, but I guess I thought that was a funny way to do. Yes, yeah. Put it on. They're lovely and warm. They're lovely. Yeah, yeah. And then, but, but, I mean, they sort of back it up a little bit, too. So again, another good friend George moment is, and you're not sitting with the prefix today either. This is, of course, talking to Percy, uh, said George, Christmas is a time for family. Like, this is one of those where it's like Fred and George rag on Percy basically relentlessly. Yeah. But like in this particular instance, they're like insisting like, no, you were sitting with us at dinner tonight. Like, right. Yeah. You know, it's like, like there no ifs, ands or buts about it. Right. Yeah. Like they do give him a hard time, but they do like love him as their brother. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's just kind of like a, like a like a nice a nice special moment. Yeah. That we, of course, get to such Chris, Christmas. Christmas. Dinner, yeah, yeah, with with a hundred fat roast turkeys, one hundred mountains, mountains of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of chipolata, multiple kinds of potatoes as always. Yeah, yeah, uh, chipolatas, uh, terrines of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce. It sounds amazing. It does. It like sounds, it makes me like, so hungry. Yeah, I'm like like literally salivating just 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 like kind of describing it. The other kind of cool thing that I that I like on behalf of Hogwarts is the fact that there are the stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. Um, this is this is kind of neat because I feel like it's also one of those areas where like like you know Harry ultimately ends up like leaving you know with a set of um, wizard chess yeah you know so like like it's almost like a way to ensure that like if you're a student who stayed behind it's kind of like a conscious awareness that like if you stayed behind it might mean that you're not receiving or don't have you know like the family to go back to to have a holiday. So I, I like the fact that the crackers are not both like festive, but it's also like a way to like, you know, for the school you to got sort something. of you got some gifts. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is kind of like, you know, just neat. Uh, I had to look up what a rear admiral's hat is just it's because like a military hat, right? It is a military hat. Yeah. And I mean, like if it was just a admiral's hat, I would have had no questions whatsoever. Right. Yeah. It's the, I was like rear rear. Why? A rear admiral's hat is just an actual position. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's just that's just simply it. Like in 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 the navy, there's just yeah, the rear just admiral. The rear admiral got yeah. charge of the back of the boat. Back of the boat. Sure. Yeah. yeah why not? Yeah. Why not? Um, I, also, there's the the scene where um, a flaming Christmas pudding followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in the slice. Uh, I looked this up, and this is a common um, British tradition to bake items into um, like the holiday puddings. Oh, the cake. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's a that is not just sort of like a, like what's the sickle doing in there it's like this is this is something that would be like you know pretty pretty common and that's cool yeah so i thought that was kind of neat uh you get like a, a a scene that doesn't seem like it would make sense in any other book especially the more you get to know the characters but um haggard getting redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine finally kissing professor mcgonagall on the cheek who to harry's amazement giggled and blushed her top hat lopsided <laughs> it's like i feel like the more we get to know these characters the less likely that seems like that would happen i know right yeah um, <laughs> but but that's okay good that's okay still fun yeah. everyone just having a good Christmas dinner. Yep, yep. Love both of them. Yep. Uh, Harry, of course, then gets his uh, non-explodable luminous balloons and grow your own warts kit, <laughs> 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 which is like one of those things where I'm like, I'm like, some of these gifts, including <coughs> his wizard chest hat, are cool. The grow your own warts kit. I'm like, and why would you want that? And, uh, yeah, what what is this? Actually, there was um, 
on Disney Plus this year, they released a new like Mickey Mouse Halloween. It's like a claymation sort of thing okay. that my kids watched a bunch of times. And like the bad guy, quote unquote, is like this witch who turns them all into their costumes. Okay. So like, you know, like I think like Minnie becomes an actual spider. Oh, and da- sure. Daisy is dra- Daisy and Donald are the princess and the frog. So Donald gets turned into a frog and Daisy gets turned into a princess. And she keeps joking like, this worked out for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with this. <laughs> anyway, there's one scene where the witch is like getting ready for over for everyone to get there and she p- pulls out some like wart cream and she like puts it on her nose and all the warts like pop up and she's like ah works as advertised and I was like that's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's she like, wants warts because she's a witch oh I <laughs> yeah. see I see oh yeah yeah, yeah. It's, like, it, yeah. it's part of it's part of the appearance you gotta yeah. have it yeah, gotta yeah, have yeah. It. Uh, we have our, our um, furious snowball fight on the grounds. Um, then they have more food, which also sounds good. Meal of turkey sandwiches, crumpets. Uh, wait, crumpets. Was that the word from earlier? Oh, wait. Yeah, so they have English muffins and crumpets. Hey, wait a second. Wait we, a minute. We know that word. In- yeah, there you go. So English muffins earlier, but just went for straight for crumpets this time. Trifle and Christmas cake. Everyone f- felt full and sleepy. This is just like, I mean, just a total aside, but I feel like there is sort of this like snow day sensation of like being out in the cold having so much fun but like being in the snow is exhausting it is yeah like, you know especially if you're like sledding or like or having a snowball fight and like running up and down a hill mm-hmm. or, or whatever and there, there is like a warm uh like sleepy dreamy state that i feel like i can like go back to from my childhood that just makes me think of this particular moment so absolutely i, I just like that mm-hmm. um but anyway um at this point in time, uh, you know, Harry is just basically like, I think he is struggling to sleep and he is thinking about the uh, the, the, the cloak, cloak from his father and specifically in the note. And this is another one of those like Dumbledore's big plan nods where he specifically uses the phrase use it well. Um, and, and like this is like one of those things where like if you're the headmaster of the school and you have just given one of the students quite literally a deathly hallow yeah. which i mean that aside still just an invisibility cloak and encouraging the usage of said cloak yeah like this this by itself suggests to me that like dumbledore is like like i am giving you this now now is the time to use it right like and like, i mean that is going to be doubled down later in the chapter as well yes it 100 yeah. percent is yeah. um and, and harry seems to basically just sort of like like inherently understand this like you know it's like he, he kind of knows like like there's like a draw a pull like yeah he, he's like taking I those words go. i'm gonna try i'm gonna try it i love the sentence he says you could go anywhere in this anywhere and filch would never know and it's like yeah you'd think you would You'd think. think that would be the case, Harry. I know, I know. The thing I wrote down too, because he's like, he could go anywhere, anywhere in the ha- castle that he wishes, and he goes to the library. I know, I'm like the <laughs> library, the restricted the section. Ro- yeah. <laughs> good times, good times. Yeah. Um. No, but it is it is kind of fun to me that I feel like of of all things, like I, but it's just like yeah, he wants to go to he wants to go to the library. He wants it's to like, go to the library. If you're Dumbledore and you're sitting there waiting for him in the mirror of Erised room, which he is, and, yeah, which he is, and and you're, you're like. He went to the library. Oh, come on. Uh, come on. Also, <laughs> like I imagine. Also, I love that Harry's in the library and he like has he lit a lamp to see his way. And it says the lamp looked as if it was floating along in midair. And it's like, dude, that's kind of a giveaway. Like, is what is the of point giveaway. of the cloak? If you're yeah. going to hold something outside the cloak, right? What are you right. doing? Yep. Yep. You have anonymity in the event that somebody discovers you, I would say. Yeah. Uh, which which Dumbledore himself, <laughs> when he does discover him, is, I think he makes like a comment, uh, something along the lines of how how um, strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you, said Dumbledore, um, you know, which I think is sort of like uh, like maybe maybe exactly what we're, we're witnessing happen in this on this particular page here is that he is uh, Harry is failing to realize the obvious shortcomings because he's invisible. He's right. Like, I'm safe doing whatever I want, including having my hand half exposed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no one could see me. Yep. There we go. Um, we b- he basically goes to the, the restricted section, um, cracks open one of the books, which immediately starts shrieking, which is, you know, it's basically like he's his first foray with invisibility, <laughs> invisibility cloaking. Is I know. G- backfiring r- I w- tremendously. I was wondering, it doesn't like say how he like sets the like um, chooses the book. It just has a large black and silver volume caught his eye. Like I, I was curious as I was reading that, like if like if we ever come across this book again, 
later cool, on. Like, cause it, like, could this have been like one of the Horcrux books or something like that? It totally feels like it could be. Yeah, it like I would yeah. need to go check the description of um, whenever they get evil most or yeah, magic most evil. Yeah, magic most evil yeah. or whatever. Yeah, because that, that, that is the book itself. That would be that would be such a fun detail. Of, like Harry, like accidentally like put like oh this one drew it like he was drawn to it because it was like about Horcruxes. No, or that would be that would be straight that'd up be, fascinating. That'd be great. And but. that that literally could just be the. I mean, if he's got the piece of Tom Riddle's soul inside of him inside of this moment, then it means that Tom Riddle himself had previously held this book. Exactly. So it, exactly. Yeah, it would guide him towards it. I like Ooh, that. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's just headcanon for me. There it is. Um, yeah. This, I, that was magic most evil. <laughs> that was magic. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally love that. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, he immediately causes such a loud stir, which then, of course, is another one of those instances where, where Filch is just apparently like out patrolling uh, in the middle of the night, and even though he's also patrolling out in the middle of the day. When when the poor man sleeps. Well, um, there, there is a little bit of a different one on this one because he goes to Snape and he says, you asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night and somebody has been in the library. Restricted section. So it's like he is a little bit more out there like on purpose, I guess. And it like occurred to me as I read this one that like Snape has asked Filch to come to him. So it's like I wonder like what is who is like Snape? We know is on the lookout for Quirrell, though. Yes. So it's like this trap with Filch is actually meant for Quirrell, not one of the students. Yeah, I wrote the exact same note. Okay, so that to me, though, and we also know Dumbledore asked Snape to look for Quirrell or whatever. And Dumbledore, we also know that Dumbledore has put the mirror in the room that it's in because he wants Harry to come find it. Yes. Right. So the mirror is a little bit more exposed and less protected on this night. So to me, the math is that Snape has Filch on the lookout for Quirrell because Dumbledore told Snape to look for Quirrell because Dumbledore knows (gasps) that where the stone is hidden is a little bit more exposed on this night. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Even though Dumbledore himself is in the room with the mirror. <laughs> Even though Dumbledore himself. So, yeah, I mean, nobody's yeah. going to get past Dumbledore. But the other thing Dumbledore knows, and, and again, going back to Dumbledore's big plan, the thing is, is that nobody's ever going to defeat the mirror. That's the like, other thing, too. The, the mirror is, is like, literally, you know, it, this is the thing. It's, like, what the what the obstacles really feel like to me because it's, like, who who what kind of logic is it that it's, like, no, you can't seal this thing unless you can beat my challenges first. I know, right, exactly. You know, it's, like, what it really feels like is the challenges are just a giant trap to lock you deep inside of the base underneath the school right you know it's like so as long as the the traps don't hurt you along the way first which many of them which can, many of them good then you're just going to be deep inside of a cellar that you can't escape nor can you do anything with yeah um but yeah no I, I like your thought there which would be that like yeah on snape is asking filch for help because dumbledore has asked snape for help and it all has to do with coral and the fact is is that what coral is ultimately going to find deep in the chamber is the mirror of Erised, which is currently just in an unlocked classroom. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, is holding the stone. Is holding the stone. Yeah. yeah. So that was going to be my, one of my questions for, for the thing is whether or not you think the stone is already in there. I do think it is. Because otherwise, like, I mean, otherwise, if it's not, then Hagrid got it from Gringotts on July 31st and it's just been out in the open in Dumbledore's office. Yeah. True. Effectively. Yeah, until you know. Christmas. So for, for yeah. what, how many months is that? Yeah. Quite a while. Yeah. For like, yeah, like five four. months or something. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't sound right. So no. I think it is already in there like even now yeah um <coughs> this is the tiniest little note in a total aside but i did notice just uh, i i haven't normally caught these before there's a tiny jim dale narration error oh um and and sometimes it's the case that we're, we're reading the american copies versus the like the british copy and there's like little mini like you know small differences mm-hmm. and stuff um but he does refer to snape uh when it says let's see here um because his soft greasy voice was getting nearer and to his horror it was snape uh in the in the jim dale audiobook he says Snipe. 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 I read I listened snipe. to it three times just to be sure. I was like, am I hearing it wrong? It's like, no, he in fact says snipe. Mm. So just a little little Easter egg there. Um but either which way, so the arrival of both Snape and Filch uh basically forces Harry to pretty much, you know exit the premises as yeah. quickly as he can. Um, and interestingly, it is actually running from um, a situation that sort of leads him into the room, uh, the unused classroom, where the Mirror of Air set is currently being held. Yes. Um, Which sort of seems lucky. Like, I don't know how Dumbledore thought Harry was just going to stumble upon the mirror. 
But you know, <coughs> I, I mean, that's true, and it's like this is like one of those things where it seems like you know just Dumbledore's intuition on some level. That was actually going to be my first thought when it came to Harry going to the restricted se- restricted section. I like our magic most evil idea better, but my thought was almost like if Dumbledore's just literally following Harry like from afar throughout the night, like if he's like you're not in the right place and I need to guide you somewhere else. If Dumbledore almost like caused the screaming. Bug, oh, oh, you interesting. Know, and, and Dumbledore sort of like, nope, you're not in the right spot. Keep looking. Keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get you there eventually. Um, so that was that was my first thought, but I, I, I much prefer the magic most evil. Yeah, and oh, I like yeah. the fact that, that would just be like a dark and terrifying, loud screaming book. Um, the magnificent mirror as high as the ceiling is an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet. I, I have always loved the mirror of air. Oh, it's, it's one a, of my yeah. favorite magical artifacts. Very cool artifact. If yep. you if you've never discovered the the not so hidden secret of it, the era set, of course, stands for desire. And if you read the inscription carved around the top backwards or in the mirror, it says, I show not your face, but your heart's desire, Boom. Um, which is kind of like one of those cool things that I like just goes unexplained in the story. Like it's it's sort of like a little Easter egg for you to discover. Yeah. on your own. And I love yeah. that you could solve it by sh- looking at it in a mirror in a mirror it's very clever it's very clever um yep uh at this point in time though this is uh there's a couple of interesting little bits um one of them is that harry is still wearing the invisibility cloak yeah and the mirror is still able to reflect him yes which i think will pair nicely with our next piece of of theory that we'd like to share with you guys Mm -hmm. today um so basically our thought is and this goes back to something that Dumbledore will eventually say to Harry inside of King's Cross Station after Harry has, has essentially intentionally faced death uh, right at the end there. Um, but Harry asks whether or not the Deathly Hallows are real. And inside of that sentiment, Dumbledore says, whether or not three brothers met death on a lonely road, I don't think so. But the three Peveril brothers were likely very gifted weather- wizards and succeeded in creating those powerful objects. Yes. So what this means is that the Peveril brothers, once upon a time, dating back before the founding of Hogwarts, I believe. I th- it's it's very hard to say yeah. um, whether the Peverils came first or the founders came first because okay. we know at the very least at some point the Slytherin line intermingles with the sec the second brother's line right because yes. the um the resurrection stone becomes a gaunt family heirloom you're correct yeah yeah because they think it's the peveril coat of arms um not the not the symbol of the deathly hallows okay so that's a good point but either way what it means is that these these men were once upon a time possibly a full millennium ago uh were quite the inventors and were able to create things that even within the the confines or the not the lack of confines of magic are able to do things that that standard magic cannot do right um and so they they all sort of have you know possibly different underlying objectives uh and one of one of my proposed or one of our proposed theories rather is that the second brother basically sought to create the resurrection stone so if you take away the idea that death plucked a river stone and, and turned it into the ability to bring back your your lost love right or, or, well that's know. what he's really trying to do is bring back his lost fiance, um, fiance. yes yeah. exactly so we we know that the second brother's true objective is is effectively to do that um and so what we have proposed before is that prior to the creation of the resurrection stone the second brother encountered a boggart and what the boggart typically is capable of doing is creating uh, your worst fear in physical form. And the the basis of the thought here is that if the second brother was like, well, what if we were able to inverse the ability of the boggart and get it to show you your heart's truest desire? So maybe what you might say is that it reflects the ability right, yeah. <laughs> of like, the yeah. boggart. <laughs> right. um, and, and essentially what he would have created or or taken a boggart and done is transfigured it into the mirror of Eris. Yeah, or like trapped it in a mirror in the way that Dumbledore puts the stone in the mirror or something. Yeah, yes, yeah. precisely. Yep, exactly. And um, pretty much the thought is is that we know that the resurrection stone ultimately is the the downfall of the second brother, and what it does is not um, bring him what he truly desires, but like sort of like a, a a a very light version of his lost love, as if seen through a veil, as if seen through a veil. Yeah. So it's interesting to me, and it feels like because there's a line in here when Harry is seeing Lily, it says he noticed that. She she was crying. So like that to me is very interesting because it sounds like it it really is like Lily standing there. It's not like because 
at, when he sees her, he doesn't even know who it is. Right. You know, yeah. like, and yet she's already crying. Right. So it's like he, like, it's, it seems like it's truly Lily and James like staring at him from beyond from beyond like yes. it's not just like it's not just Harry's desire it's like I mean it is his desire but it's not just like reflecting what he wants because again he doesn't even know what they look like right and it's like and it is showing exactly them they show up anyway without him knowing what they look like so right. there's that and then the fact that she is able to have like an emotional reaction to cry right is that like that this is it's like it's them this is the informed Lily who knows that this boy has lived without her exactly exactly so there's that and then it's like and, but then like harry is able to call them back with the resurrection stone as well right in like the same way so like it it does seem like it's sort of the same magic at play it in does. both cases and, and in both cases i mean even dumbledore's own description of the dangers of the mirror mirror of Erised is that men have wasted away before it right and and i i think you could make the argument that the second brother wasted away on like uh, upon his usage of the resurrection stone right um so anyway that's I, I i think it fits so beautifully so perfectly um and even the fact that you know th th this is a question for you i mean we know that at one point in time dumbledore sought the deathly hallows kind of seems like the mirror of Eris had was in his possession oh it seems like yeah he's the one who has it like yeah i mean he we know it was there when uh, at least during the time of Fantastic Beasts as well. Yes, yes. And so I, he, he's had it since, f since at least the 1930s? Yeah, so at least since then. It's like whether it belongs to the castle or Dumbledore is kind of up for debate. Right. But he certainly knows about it and used it then. Right, right. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So anyway, my, my headcanon in this particular case is that the, the Mirror of Air said was created by the second brother. By the second brother. Yep. Yeah, although, man, as I'm thinking about it, there's like not, um, like the... The second brother we know brings back his fiance with the resurrection stone right. and like because he can't be with her he ends up like um uh killing himself. Yeah. Right. But we also know that Voldemort is a descendant of the second brother, right? So how does he have a descendant? So how does he have any descendants, right? Like because for that to be true it basically means cuz like it it means he must have either had a who Cadmus Cadmus is the second brother yes Cadmus, so yeah. and it seems like Cadmus had one great love so it it just sounds like they must have had a child together before they got married but then where's the child where is the child <laughs> yeah I, I does mean, he just abandon the child it's, it's hard to know yeah. because I mean the primary premise of the story that we hear includes the idea of of death himself yeah granting these three gifts to yeah. the three brothers and in i tend to believe dumbledore's version of it more yeah um when it really comes down to it so i think that they were talented wizards so i mean on some level the idea of even if um cadmus were to have had a child with someone else it almost even feels like it would fit in the same way that Tom Riddle was the product of, you know, Marope, Marope Gaunt and um, Tom Riddle Sr., mm -hmm. where it's like um, like an otherwise sort of unrequited love. Yeah. You know, like like he's the product of... If Cadmus's child, that was the start of that lineage, sort of also shared that commonality with Tom Riddle himself, Voldemort himself. Yeah. Like the product of... Uh, it, what am I trying to say here? Not being the product of love. It, like it feels like that would be possibly something that would it that could would be. that would fit um but, but whoever the child is they must end up with the ring too like he must have you know because the or he must end up with the stone sure because it yep. stays in the family this is a good point right so there's like a there's like a missing peveril child along the way well, here <laughs> as per as per ever i mean you know this this goes back to our, our deepest desire you know if, if like we talked about you know there being a long form harry potter series but what we would truly love above all else is is like a founder series and i could completely see a world i would be okay with adjusting the canon to reflect a world where the peverils and the founders exist in the same sequence of events mm -hmm. in, in some capacity or else if the peverils are relevant to that narrative in some way shape or it form does seem like that would have to be the case in in some way shape or form as well yeah um or like yeah that they could they could at least like meet them or something because they would otherwise be three great powerful wizards of the day that's the thing yeah, yeah exactly exactly so i mean even even a world where 
you could have opposing ideals where the founders themselves are more in the spirit of we need to share our magical knowledge. And I could see a world where the Peverils are highly talented wizards who did the opposite. And right. they, they thought we don't share right. what, what we know, mm-hmm. you know, and that's part of what makes those artifacts in particular because nobody else has ever made anything else like them. I know. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, they, they stand alone in their unique abilities. Yeah. I mean, I could, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they like all interacted with each other because you could definitely see like Salazar interacting with Cadmus or something in some way as like a little like, oh, eh. Oh, their offspring are going to get together someday or something. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, they are. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, this true. is the other thing that people don't think about is that Salazar Slytherin, they're like, oh, has I, a child. Has a child. Has a child. He has a child. Yeah. Like, there is a great lost love somewhere with Salazar Slytherin yes. as well. And it's yes. like that, that part, like, Mm, there's something there that we don't know about. We 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 could we could tangent so hard and uh, just just go into all of our thoughts and feelings on on like what mm, the founder's life was like and and how Slytherin attained his his you know what is otherwise infamous perspective on you know relations between the wizarding and non wizarding populations yes. and oh, stuff. I mean such such thoughts I have such yeah. thoughts I have right no I know yep. yeah mm-hmm. so anyway in the meantime in the meantime um, Harry seeing his family for the first time I was gonna say we we literally tangented right before like the most impactful portion of the whole chapter. <laughs> well, it's a very sad part. It is very sad. Maybe we were just maybe we were just uh, mm-hmm. we were, we were uh, delaying the inevitable, which is just this this idea of such a young child who has basically had to live, you know, essentially like a solitary existence, doesn't know what his own family looks like, and is <sighs> now being granted <sighs> the ability to look into the faces of his two just parents. Hate the Dursleys. Like I, I know. that boy. I don't know. I mean, they're obviously terrible to. Him, but I'm just circling back to it in my mind. Like it has not occurred to me before that Petunia never showed Harry a picture of, of her, of her of even her, just of at her least Lily. Yeah. At, oh my God, it makes me so bad. I know. And, and this is, the, and I, I think it's just a deleted movie scene only, which breaks my heart that they deleted it. But there, there is one scene I believe from Deathly Hallows part one where the Dursleys are leaving and there's an exchange with Petunia where she basically says like, you're not the only one who lost someone that day. And it's always been one of those things that I think humanizes Petunia in a way that's helpful Mm -hmm. um, where it's sort of like, like maybe, maybe part of like this, this great big defense that she has, the reason that she, she has such hostility towards magic, like, like at this point isn't even her jealousy from childhood, but it's more the mourning sensation she's experiencing attack to the loss of her sister who she once loved so dearly yeah you know and it's just like like it just it just sucks all the way around so i i much prefer a world where petunia has like like more of like a deep struggle not not that it's defensible um in any capacity nor that harry should ever have been subjected to the life that he was subjected to but um anyway that's that's my thoughts on that um but yeah so harry harry gets this experience of um being able to look into the faces of his his two parents. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought, edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, exactly the same shape. But then he noticed that she was crying, smiling but crying at the same time. The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. Um, this is this is just like it's a very cool moment. It's amazing to see Harry seeing himself and his two parents. I love the way in which Harry embodies both parents and his physical attributes. Um, one of the one of the details that I've only just recently stumbled across that I've been curious to hear your, to hear your thoughts on is whether or not James is. Patronus and Animagus form as a stag is at all supposed to reflect his extremely untidy hair. Like oh, the, oh, like, oh, oh, like it, his hair sticks up like antlers. Like antlers. <laughs> yeah. Is, is that like supposed to be a thing? Or is it I am don't I, am know. I that um, that I mean it 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 could be there. It, it be yeah, there. I mean it always looks like I never imagine Harry's like hair sticking up like antler style. I always imagine there being like a cowlick in the back that like won't go down or something. Yeah, it's it's always messier <clears throat> than I feel like the movies ever depicted. You know, like, yeah, like especially true. in in uh in in the first movie, he's almost got more of like like just like a long bowl cut. It's yeah. Not, it's not exactly like unruly. Right, yeah. Um but yeah, so it's that just just such a good moment. Um and then of course, yeah, mom, he whispered, Dad just break, uh, break you right in half. <laughs> it's so sad. Just a moment of uh, silence. So much worse as a parent, too. I know. Oh, my gosh. I know. Can't imagine. Can't your kid imagine. having that experience. So anyway, um, 
we can work ourselves through this. We can surely do it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So it's in, in the movie, he only sees his parents. And in the in the book, he actually sees like his entire extended family back there. Yep. Which is kind of cool. Um, gosh. Yeah. Anyway, well, then he runs back to Ron. Yeah. Well, I guess it's the next morning. Yeah. Um, I th- yeah. So he says, you could have woken me up, said Ron Crossley. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. Um, I, I love the fact that Ron immediately says, I'd love to see your mom and dad. And I know, you know what a good ha- friend. I know. But then Harry matches and he says, and I want to see all your family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to show me your other brothers and everyone. Um, and Ron's like, you can see them any old time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whatever. They're not very special. <laughs> right. Right. Which kind of plays into it. Like Ron, it's like he says that like as if like, oh, yeah, whatever. They're just there. But then like Ron's deepest ambition, like a page later is to like to to like be just like all of them. Well, it's to be just like all of them. But there's a couple of like th- there is also also the additional layer for Ron in that like he is constantly um, having to try to find a way to stand out amongst the siblings because yeah. he is just standing alone right uh, when when Ron looks in the mirror and the kind of interesting thing about Ron in, in what he's seeing in the mirror is it says no I'm alone but I'm different I look older and I'm head boy I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to and I'm holding the house cup the Quidditch cup I'm Quidditch captain too um, what's what's kind of fascinating about this is that like it is Almost all of this, in some capacity, sort of comes to fruition. Maybe not quite to the extent that that Ron's envisioning it here. But on the one hand, Ron, in his fifth year, does become um, a prefect. Yep. Um, he is on the Quidditch team. Mm. He is the hero. You know, there's the whole Weasley is our king. Uh, he's the one who's able to bring home the Quidditch cup. Yep. But even the alone thing is oddly reflected in that part of him being the hero of the team comes in the wake of uh, Fred, George, and Harry all being kicked off the right. team. Yeah. So like Ron seeing himself alone, it does almost like foreshadow like, and then eventually alone, Ron is the one right. to, you know, like a well, Ginny's still on the team. Is but Jean- I guess yeah. he's not being compared. I guess even in this sense, he's not comparing himself to her. It's like to all of his older brothers. That's true. So yeah, there's that. that. Cast but yeah. Shadow. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah, he does always want to stand down. And then he ultimately like, you know, does defeat, you know, one of the Horcruxes and all that. So yeah, he stands out pretty good. Yeah. Ron does a good job. Yeah. Good, good job. job good job. Yeah. yeah. Way to go, Ron. Way to go, Ron. <laughs> solid, um, solid work. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it is kind of interesting. And I'd be curious. I mean, it doesn't take very long before we get the full explanation. But I'd be curious if, if people would be able to, you know, start to piece together uh, what exactly is going on, like why they're seeing different things or, or you know, like what the underlying function mm-hmm. of the mirror is, which I think sort of like tease us up uh, for Harry going back on his third night, which I guess at this point in time is December 27th. Yep. Because we would have gone on Christmas. Uh, the next night with Ron and the, the 27th. Yep. Yep. Um, at this point in time, uh, Harry finds his way back to the room. Once again, he's looking into uh, the faces of his mother and father when he hears somebody in the room with him. So back again, Harry. Yes. Back again means that he knows about the other two times. Yes. Yes, he does. Yep. So the, the big question to me is sort of whether or not. Yeah. Like was, was is Dumbledore just <clears throat> in the room? On each occasion, he almost has to be because, um, well, he at the very least has to be there on the second night because he knows what Ron saw in the mirror, too. R- yes, right. Yes. So yes, there's exactly. that. And it's like it seems unusual to me that he wouldn't have been there the first night. Um, and the, the way he says so back again, like it doesn't sound like. I mean, I guess you could just mean like, oh, you were here last night and tonight. That could be again. But like it almost like implies like, oh, again, again. Right. Like like it's like I think he's been there every single night. Yes. Yeah. Seeing what um, what Harry uh, is seeing. Yes. So um, strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. It's like he knows Harry's been out in the invisibility cloak because, of course, he knows he's the one who gave it to him. Yes, of course. Which Harry doesn't know. Uh, And he's like smiling at Harry. So it's like, ah, you've you've done beautifully, Harry. Like, you know, not only did you get the cloak, you put it on, you found the mirror, and what you saw in the mirror, my God, I'm just beaming over here. Like, this is great. Could not be more proud. Could Could not not be more proud. Um, Then, of course, uh, you know, we get the, the explanation, you know, basically the happy man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Eris head like a normal mirror that is he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is uh which i put uh, just an ounce of emphasis on because i feel like when dumbledore himself is asked the question uh what would you see when you look in the mirror um dumbledore basically says i see myself uh holding a pair of thick woolen socks um this is this is sort of like a 
you could interpret it a couple of different ways. The socks modifier is certainly a rather small one in the scheme of things. Yeah. You know, it would basically mean that like Dumbledore's most like like he basically sees himself exactly as he is with a pair of socks. Right. You know, it's like that's what I really need because people only give me books, but I really I know, still it's like, need. It's like it's not that hard to get socks. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it feels yeah. like you could do that. Dumbledore on a, on a headmaster, Sally, it's attainable. What is yeah. what's interesting is that we eventually learn what Dumbledore would see in the mirror and it is just his family together and whole, which is uh, awesome. But when you think about it, it's basically the same thing Harry sees. Yes, know, a little bit, which also pretty much tracks um, with like if you get more into like Dumbledore's history, like with the um, in what is it? Secrets of Dumbledore at the end of it, like the chillin like kneels to him and declares him as pure of heart or whatever. Yes. And it's like, oh, th- that's sort of almost like more proof of it. Like like Dumbledore is basically so proud of Harry because Harry sees he's like, do you know how many few how few people could see what you saw in the mirror? But it's like Dumbledore also basically sees what Harry sees in the mirror. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like I, I think that this is this is probably verification for Dumbledore at this point in time. Like this this boy is like like a piece of me like you know yeah. he, he like he's he's already like he's got, very pure he's very pure but, but like and like Dumbledore wouldn't have seen that until later in life like much later in life correct as well because we know that um, as a as a much younger Dumbledore not even a much younger like uh, yeah, I don't 40 know. 50 yeah. years prior 40 50 years prior Dumbledore is seeing Grindelwald in the mirror yes yeah yeah so like it like Harry arrives there he's like basically born and is as pure as Dumbledore eventually gets to much later in life. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, um, he even says that to Harry. He's like, I've known for a long time now that you're a much better man than me or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I've known since the moment you saw that mirror. I was like, whoa, okay, this kid. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Uh, and that being said, um, we then get the line. Uh, this is the last like little like major wink from uh, Dumbledore's big plan kind of concept. The mirror, the mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry. And I ask you not go looking for it again. And if you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's like mean? if you do run across it and I know where it'll be hidden in a secret chamber under the school where no one should ever run across it ever. But if you do see it yeah, now, you, now, you, you know, know what's going on. Yeah. 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 And like, what do you mean? You know what? You'll, you'll be prepared. Prepared for what? To see his parents again? Like, right. what does he need to be prepared for? Right. But it, I mean, it all seems to like fit together to me. It's like basically like, okay, it's it's the winter holidays. It's a great time to present Harry with a gift, especially anonymously, because it's sort of like, you know, like it's a, it's a time where it's not just like oh, like the broomstick, you know, like it, it's like this is a time when people receive gifts so we can like innocuously present the gift. Right. It's also when most of the students are not inside of the school. Right. The gift itself presents the ability to then wander about the school. So it's like the the mirror being where it is when it is during this particular time all of Dumbledore's like you know meddling all all but suggest to me that he's basically like okay here's the moment like mm-hmm. we are we are inside of the 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 stage of the plan where there's nobody we don't have to worry about anybody stumbling in on us he will he will absolutely you know as long as he's his, his father's son he will go exploring in the middle of the night you know my, yeah. my hope is that he will just stumble across the mirror because he just need like the one thing that that I you know that I can't count on Ron or Hermione or his other teachers to to impart upon him you know is how and what the mirror actually is so this is the occasion right let's do it and and, and in the process Dumbledore is also testing Harry's worthiness yeah that he is that he is and that pretty much brings us to the end of the chapter I don't have a ton more to say but the final sentence is just uh but then he thought as he shoved scabbers off his pillow it had been quite a personal question and I was just like man oh good good look at you Peter sleeping on Harry's pillow how dare you what a what a just how a, what a jerk dare you what yeah, the man. Harry Harry the gall on that rat I know I, especially because like what Harry is going to do on these occasions where he's not in his own bed is to see his parents the parents they, who are not there because of Peter I I know, I know exactly. And like Scabbard, like Peter knows. He's even watching him go under the cloak. They would have seen James doing it. Yeah. Like, ugh. Oh, uh, uh, Peter sucks. Peter does suck. Oh Peter my gosh. He's like as bad as the Dursleys. Oh my gosh. And Aunt Marge, who I also don't like at all. Aunt Marge um, is basically like Umbridge Light. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. The the thing, the thing that I sort of love, you know, to sort of to, to close off the chapter, the thing that, that is fascinating to me is about the mirror of Eris. Like I always wonder, you know, and, and of course the, the ever personal question question I'm like what would you see inside of the mirror of yeah. said. I think a lot of times for me I always find it like I feel like it would be rather informative like I think in a lot of ways 
there's a part of me that like, you know, I know the things that I deeply value. I know the things that are important to me, but like, I almost feel like if I were to look into the mirror of Erised and have something proven back to me, it's like, Ben, the thing you value the most is this. Right. And it's like, I think it would like sort of like solidify because like, I think I'm able to underestimate every important thing in some way, shape or form, mm -hmm. or, or I'll like, I'll like let myself believe like, oh, it's cliche for that to be like, you know, for, for, for this to be the most important thing to me, like that's, that's you, you're, you're, you're following the storybook logic, you know, or right, something yeah. like that, you know, um, but what is, what is truly right, most like, important like to achieving you? world peace or something, Ben should be like the most important thing to you. Like, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, you know, I mean, that don't like, be so basic. What, what do you see in the mirror? I see myself achieving world peace, of course, as should everybody. It's right. Like, yeah. <laughs> the like, correct answer. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. It's like, no, you see yourself just like sitting on a beach and you know some <coughs> some type of really cool place and maybe there's like some treasure to be found and like a boat kind of station just offshore it's like it's like like it would be so interesting for me to look in the mirror and be like that it been literally i'm telling you right now that is what you want the most you think you'd be surprised by what you saw i think i, I think i would be surprised by what i saw yeah um i i do genuinely and i i also feel like i would pursue it um, yeah, I feel like it could because like, yeah, I think you're right. I think people are good at lying to themselves. I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think it's hard to know. Like you you can it's like anything else. Like what's your what's your Patronus? What's your Bogger? You know, like they're all they're all like highly informative questions. What house are you in? Um, they're all questions that sort of like show some piece of your character or, or what you value the most. But like it's a complicated question to answer. Yeah. It so is. for me to be presented with the answer to that question, like that's like the like that maybe that's a, maybe that's what I would see is me knowing the answer. Uh, right. Like, yeah. Maybe above all else, what I would love is to just know what I would see. Maybe. Maybe. So anyway, uh, maybe, maybe what that means is that I would see a version of myself looking into the mirror and that version of me inside of the mirror would be like jumping for joy because that version of me knows what I saw. Oh, very meta. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Know, the meta yeah. mirror. The meta mirror. Classic. Right. Anyway, uh, as ever, we need to review the chapter art, which I feel like yes, we, never, we, we never review very aggressively, but um, I... <laughs> It's basically just Harry looking into the mirror. It is Harry looking into the mirror. Um, I think that we, you and I uh, have mirrors in our homes that are kind of like nice gold or, or, or no, not real gold. Not obviously. real, yeah. But we, we, we bought the same Calm one. down. Yeah, but they're, they're mirror of Arised esque mirrors. They are, yeah. Um, I, I do tend to, I, I actually, I will say in this particular instance, I actually like the movie prop version of the mirror more than the the presented illustration although oh, yeah i do like how grand and tall it is in the chapter art yeah but i see it more as a um uh it's it's a rectangle mirror in the chapter art and i see it more as like a uh i don't know like it comes to like a point like an arched like yeah an arched like, yeah top. something yeah. like that yeah. yeah in the the chapter art almost makes it look like it like was an animal or something like it's got like 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 its clawed feet are like were feet and like it's the stand on the back was like a tail or something. You're right. Yeah. It yeah. Seems to go look like it could have been like a lion or something. Yeah. It kind of it does. Lion is exactly what I was thinking too. Because yeah. maybe because the mirror is sort of in the shape of like a uh, like a mane or like the frame kind of looks like a mane. Yep. And yep. then it's as if like which is it's kind of funny because Harry is in a Gryffindor looking and it's like what is the reflected lion in you or something you know. Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Even at the top, if you look carefully, it almost seems like a pair of eyes. Kind of, kind of right up top there. It does. You're right. Circles. It kind of looks like little, little uh, circles actually, there. You know, if you really look at it, it kind of looks like Baby Grogu from Star Wars. Oh my gosh, Do you're you right. If you, I definitely see it. Yeah, that's kind of amazing. A thousand percent. Yeah, oh, that's man. amazing. That's so funny. Anyway, okay. okay so great chapter art. Well there done, we Harry. I love how giant the mirror looks in comparison. To, I guess it's like twelve feet tall or something, right? It's huge. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like very tall, very Massive tall. But we mirror. also know, considering the the height of the troll, that even just the bathrooms in Hogwarts have pretty high ceilings. Yeah, so, it's it's yeah. big old big old place, lots big old place. Of, lots of room for vertical yep. furniture. Let's see. And then, uh, as ever, we have a review from one of our amazing listeners. Um, this Oh, man, I didn't copy the name. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no. It just says, amazing. So good. I'm from Sweden, but live, live in England. And peppermint humbugs are a British sweet or candy. I listen to the podcast every day. Please can you do more than one episode a week? All my friends and family listen to this podcast. So thank you for inventing it. Oh, oh. that's so amazing. Man, I, 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 I don't think we'll do more than one a week. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, but we want to, you know, 
give ourselves a lot of runway here. However, we have discussed doing like after we've like finished a book, putting together like a like a a, a giant like, super cut so you could listen to us review all seventeen chapters at once. Yeah, like one. Yeah, one, one like, after the other. One big long seventeen hour. Seventeen cut. hour. <laughs> yeah, cut. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, like, what I like about this though is that you could go to bed at night, start listening to chapter one, wake up the next morning, and not be done. And not be done. Yeah. 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 So. I, that that would be that would be something that'd be the longest video we'd ever uploaded anywhere. This is the longest podcast, longest episode of this podcast. So there you go. We've done basically one and a half for you on today anyway. There you go. That's yeah. exactly right. That's exactly it. So uh, as ever, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this week's chapter. It, like I said from the very beginning, this is one of my favorite chapters in the entire story, in fact. So I'm glad that we were able to uh, provide as much commentary as we were. Uh, but otherwise, until next time, we will see you through the Gryffindor.